Thank you. I will officially call the meeting of October 3rd. Uh, would you call the roll, please? Councilman DeCicio. Councilwoman Guevara. Here. Councilwoman Mendoza. Here. Councilman Nowakowski. Councilwoman Pastor. Here. Councilwoman Stark. Here. Vice Mayor Waring. Here. Mayor Williams. Here. Uh, I would like to have our interpreter introduce himself. I believe it's Mario Barajas. Yes, thank you, Mayor. I am going to be uh, today's interpreter. I'm a Spanish interpreter. My name is Mario Barajas, and I'm going to be making an announcement in Spanish. Si hay alguien que necesita intérprete, uh, podrán acudir los servicios de uh, interpretación hacia allá atrás. Uh, el señor Mick uh, puede alzar la mano. Eh, él le podrá facilitar el aparato para poder escuchar la interpretación. Y nuevamente, para los que necesitan intérprete, pueden acudir allá atrás con el señor Mick. Muchas gracias. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you. Uh, we will now go to citizens' comments. I have two cards. Dennis McGarry. Each speaker has two min or three minutes. Um, we have a clock up here to, to time them. Thank you. Mayor, thank you, councilmen and councilwomen, for allowing me to speak. Um, I have two basic subjects. One is Valley Metro. I have 30 years experience working for railroads and have traveled on extensively on transit systems throughout the country and throughout the world. And quite frankly, we have the Edsel of transit here. Due to the fact that Valley Metro does not do the proper supervision that's necessary, the supervisors need to get out from behind their desks and get out there and use the system and see what's happening. You've got a private security firm working the light rail that does absolutely nothing because the platforms weren't built properly in the first place. They're not secure and they don't enforce the rules. The rules are enforced differently from one city to another because there's no umbrella agency, I don't consider Valley Metro an umbrella agency, that makes the rules the same everywhere and enforce the same. So, council members, in case you've never seen one, this is a transit pass. You folks need to get out from behind your desks and use this system and actually see how it's operating and see what we have to put up with. Today, I went to buy a pass, and because it rained in Phoenix, thank God it rained, the fare machines don't work because they didn't buy the good ones. They bought the cheapest ones possible, and they didn't put a covering on them. So every time it rains, you can't get a pass. Try getting through to Valley Metro customer service sometime and see what kind of action you get. They don't even want to talk to you. Second issue, kind of similar, is pedestrian issues in this city. Most major cities are pedestrian friendly in the fact that they widen their sidewalks, they narrow their traffic lanes to slow the traffic down in the city. Here we do the opposite. Apartment buildings and condos along the, second, uh, the central corridor, the new ones that are coming up, are allowed to build right on top of the sidewalk, no landscaping, and they take 12 to 18 inches of the sidewalk. You can't even pass each other on the sidewalk. The Edison, the Alta are two of the violators on this. You've got people that are dying in the crosswalks because of this. They don't enforce the lead light statutes. Drivers run these lead lights on a red, and if you're trying to cross in the middle of the street, good luck to you. So let's get some more pedestrian friendly, and let's get with it on Valley Metro, and let's try to at least get off of the Edsel platform. With all due respect to Edsel Ford, it's probably an insult to him, but that's what we have right now. Thank you very much. Thank you. Leonard Clark. Thank you, Mayor and Council members, and uh, I will make sure to follow the rules because last night the mayor, when she said, please, I will clear the room if you don't quiet down, everybody quieted down and followed the rules. So that's a leader. 
Even though we may disagree, they all quieted down. Um, I just wanted to bring up this concern. Uh, this is very politically unpopular, but you know, with global climate change, with the buried deep in a federal transportation report, because this affects Phoenix, we're part of this. In the president's own report released by his own people, he talks of a seven degree runaway global average temperature. You know, <laughs> I'm telling you, a lot of scientists, it's not me up here preaching the end of the world, but we have a chance to change this. And you know, I'm guilty, I love to eat, you know, uh, burritos with carne asada and all that but the vegan way is a good way if you go to anywhere mcdonald's in phoenix circle k you know they say they have non-dairy creamer which it, it has dairy in it why is it that you have to go to a vegan spot or starbucks and pay five dollars or almost for a cup of coffee to get soy milk instead of you know contributing to global warming and the suffering of cattle in these slaughterhouses why can't we do that why i ask you i know you can't pass an ordinance but you as individual leaders of our city you could say, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to drink soy milk, and you know what? Why doesn't Circle K put it in? Why doesn't McDonald's? Why can't a Phoenician go and get that? And if anybody wants to start a business right now, they're doing very successful. The young people want soy milk ice cream, cashew ice cream. You don't believe me? they got some great vegan places in Phoenix. You can get something that tastes better than ice cream. It looks exactly like ice cream, soy milk ice cream. Um, so this is... We are in some dangerous territory. Again, another unpopular subject is we are looking at a serious situation with our water. You know, I went to the subcommittee meeting and we're looking at Lake Mead and Lake Powell and we could be looking at drought. I don't want to panic people. We need to be very proactive. And I just feel that that's not happening because you're going to see people, right now everybody can say, well look, property rates are going up, Leonard. We're going to keep growing. Well, in 10 to 15 years, I tend to believe the majority of the scientists, if things continue the way they are, you're going to start seeing people saying, wait, I don't want to live in 130 degree temperatures in the valley for eight, seven or eight months of the year. I'm going to move. So we better start working at this. We don't have to wait for this seven degree runaway temperature with this Trump administration says we can do nothing about. We could be proactive right now. I know we've got committees of citizens who are trying to work on helping global climate change, but we need you to get behind it. And yes, my conservative friends, why not look at it this way? Better safe than sorry. In the Army, I looked ridiculous in basic training. I saluted a sergeant one time, but you know what they told me? If you don't salute and it's an officer, you're gonna be in big trouble. So I saluted. Better safe than sorry. Okay, say I'm wrong and you're right. Leonard, this is not happening. We're not on a path for the, the end of humanity, and the city of Phoenix is doing nothing. So thank you so much for letting me go on, and I will follow the rules today. I'll follow our chief executive. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. Uh, are there any other cards? Okay. There's no one else wishing. Uh, we will go to um, 24, hour, 24 hour paragraph. Titles of the following ordinance and resolution numbers on the agenda were available to the public at least 24 hours prior to this council meeting and therefore may be read by title or agenda item only. Ordinances number G6507 through 6514, S44998 through 44999, and 45018 through 45046, and resolutions 21676 through 21681. There are no minutes today. So we will go to boards and commissions, Vice Mayor. Move to approve Mayor and City Council boards and commission nominations as revised. Second. I have a motion and a second. All in favor, please say aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion carries unanimously. To be sworn in, I believe. Okay. Well, thank you all for doing this to begin with. Raise your right hand, please. I state your name. I do solemnly swear that I will support the Constitution of the United States and the laws of Arizona, that I will bear true faith and allegiance to the same and defend them against all enemies, foreign and domestic, and that I will faithfully and impartially
discharge the duties of the office of state your according to the best of my ability so help me God congratulations you are official to uh, liquor license applications. <clears throat> Move to approve items two through 25, except for item uh, two and item 25, which is being requested by the applicant to be continued until October 17th, 2018. Wh which one, oh, two? Uh, the 25. Oh, 25. Two has got cards. Okay, I do have cards. All in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. Unanimous. Um, item two, I do have cards. David Butler, did you want to come down and speak? There. Thank you, Mayor and uh, Council members. I'm here in support of the off-track betting application of Connolly's Sports Bar in, uh, on uh, uh, Carefree Highway. We are, uh, I, I don't exactly know at this point what the objections will be, so I'm a little bit, uh, I'm just gonna make some guesses as what they might be and try to present to you what the, uh, the situation is in off-track betting in Arizona. And after me, Brian Cavender, the owners of Connolly, owner of Connolly's will be here to speak, if you'll permit him to speak also, okay. He's uh, the next one. Good, thank you. I, I'm guessing that uh, maybe only a few of you on the council have even been to an off-track betting parlor, and I'm, I'm guessing maybe very few in the audience have been there. So let me at least explain how it works and how off-track betting is used particularly to support horse racing in Arizona. Uh, if, if a person comes in and wagers at an off-track betting parlor, uh, th there's 80% uh, of that money goes to the, uh, goes to the uh, bettors, and 7% of each of that bet goes to the uh, off-track, uh, uh, goes to the horsemen. And the horsemen use that money to pay for their, uh, uh, to pay for winnings when they, uh, when they race at our track. Off-track betting income, none of that money goes to the bar or restaurant that hosts it. All of the money that's available goes to uh, off-track uh, betting and to the Arizona Downs in particular. So that it is simply an amenity. It's, a, it's, a, it's a, like karaoke equipment that a bar can have and allowed to use in, in their uh, location. And there's really no reason to say, well, gee, if if they get it, if I have an OTB a mile away, why can't they use it also? So we're asking you, uh, to the extent there's a, a claim that it's a, there's too many OTBs a mile away, we're asking you to deny that claim. Thank you. Thank you. Brian Cavender?
Check, check. Good afternoon, Mayor and City Council members. Uh, my name is Brian Cavender. I am the owner of Conley Sports Grill. I have grown up in the Valley. I am a native. Um, I also have owned the business for about nine years. Um, I live in the community up there. I live in the district. I've been up there for about 15 years. My children grown up there. We are a family owned and operated business. Um, you know, I'm just looking to add some stuff. My business is growing, so I'm trying to add a new amenity to my business to make, uh, you know, to make my business be better. Um, I feel like that the OTB is more like, um, it's like having the UFC or having the NFL Sunday ticket. It's just something to do where you're going to give people a choice, an opportunity to go somewhere and, you know, give them a choice of where they want to go, spend their money, see if you can earn their business by doing a better job of hosting that for them. Um, I know that as far as what we've done, they went through the application, they've turned in everything that they needed to be turned in. Um, we've done all the things that we need to do. So today I just came down to tell everyone that if they could uh, please give us a yes vote, um, just so I can help continue to grow my business in the West Valley. Thank you. Mary Holtman. Good afternoon. I'm Mary Holtman. This is my husband, Jason Kennedy. We own and operate a business for 14 years on Carefree Highway and I-17. We have had a long-standing relationship with Turf Paradise as an off-track betting site. We've been, we opened in um, March of 2010, putting an off-track betting site 0.9 miles away from us goes directly against all the Turf Paradise restrictions that we've always had, which was a five-mile radius. Would you like to tell the facts, please? Yeah, operating a, another uh, off-track site um, within a mile of an existing site is uh, completely contrary to the current statistics as far as population density and proximity of the other off-track betting sites. So we feel that uh, setting up shop again within less than a mile of an existing operating business for two, two companies that operate in Maricopa County would be detrimental to the growth of our business that's already been established. Anything else? Thank, Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Uh, I, I will say at this point in time, there is no restriction, uh, a distance restriction. Staff is looking into that uh, to see if we need one in the future. Uh, this is something new that's just come up. So, Do I have a motion on item two? Move to approve item two. Do I have a second? Second. Okay. All in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries unanimously. Item 25. Uh, Mayor, I move to move item 25 to be continued to October 17th meeting. Okay. Do we have a second? Second. Uh, we have a motion to move that item to October 17th, 2018. Um, roll call. Yes. Do voice mayor. Okay. All in favor, please say aye. Opposed? Motion carries. Okay, now we are to ordinances, resolution, new business, and planning and zoning. Are we ready for the omnibus motion, we Vice are. Mayor? I move to approve items 26 to 93, except the following items 33, 36, 48, 51, 52, 53, 55, 57, 67. 89, 91, 92, and 93. Note them that item 36 will be held and heard at the end of the agenda. And item 63 is being continued to October 17th, 2018. Do I have a second? Second. I have a motion and a second. Roll call. DeCicio? Yes. Guevara? Yes. Mendoza? Yes. Nowakowski? Yes. Pastor? Yes. Stark? Yes. Waring? Yes. Williams? Yes. Uh, I believe that's 8-0. Item 33. Oh, we have cards. Uh, Leonard Clark. Should I go ahead and move and approve it? Uh, move to approve item 33. Second. Thank you, Mayor and Council Member. My name is Leonard Clark. Born right down the street at Good Samaritan Hospital. I'm strongly supporting this because 
You hear the stories across the country, bridges suddenly collapsing, infrastructure falling apart, uh, because the, uh, the leaders of their municipalities or whatever governmental organizations were not doing their job. So this is good to see that the leaders of our city are out there. I mean, it is Phoenix. I know, I don't know how many bridges we have. People probably would be very surprised, but I like to know that because, again, people can say that we don't need to have inspections, but Excuse look me. what happens back east. Excuse me, could the people leaving be quiet, please? It's very difficult to hear our speaker. They really need to close. Okay. Thank you so much, and they quieted down for you. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Walt Gray. Walter Gray. Uh, thank you, Mayor and Council. Um, I formerly worked for ADOT. ASHTO was a very respected organization. I'm just wondering, are they going to have a conference here or convention? Or what is what is the item about? Uh, Mayor, manager. Mayor, Mr. Gray, this is actually purchasing software from ASHTO. It, so it's actually a product that we procure from that organization. Thank you. Do we have a motion? Move to approve. Second. Okay. Uh, did you want to make a comment? Okay. Uh, roll call. DeCicio? Yes. Guevara? Yes. Mendoza? Yes. Nowakowski? Yes. Pastor? Yes. Stark? Yes. Waring? Yes. Williams? Yes. Uh, eight zero. Oh, the card. Okay. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> Next item is 51. Oh, 48. That's the one I was this looking one at. Not doing. Okay. <laughs> item 48. Uh, do I have a motion? Move item 48. And we have a motion and a second. Uh, I have one card. I believe this is Walter Gray. Oh, you have a question? Okay. You, let's have the card and then if. Ask your question, please. Thank you, Mayor and Council. I was just wondering, um, this public information, uh, public communications email system, uh, what is that? I'm going to ask staff. Good afternoon, Mayor and Council members. With me today is our CIO, Matt Arve. And basically, it's a communication system to send out emails to the public in mass amounts, a listserv system. Thank you, Mayor. You're welcome. Uh, Councilwoman? Thank you, Mayor. I have a few questions. Did HubSpot officially submit for an RFP, for the RFP back in March of 2021st? Mayor and Councilwoman Mendoza, HubSpot did not submit. They submitted as a partner with the company called Figleaf, mm -hmm. and Figleaf was the company that was awarded the RFP award. Okay. So I have a problem awarding a contract to a company that did not submit when they had the opportunity to submit for the RFP. Why didn't we go with the second vendor? Mayor, members of council, uh, the second vendor, uh, there were requirements within the RFP that they had to store their data within the United States, and they could not do that. But they were deemed responsive, correct? But they were from Canada. Were they deemed responsive to the RFP? They, they made it to the best and final offer, into the final two, and then when they started getting into the requirements, mm -hmm. because there were discussions, could they store their information in the United States, and at that time, they still could not. Was that language included in the RFP about storage and storing the information in the U.S.? Yes. Okay. I still have an issue with uh, awarding the contract with HubSpot when they did not submit for the RFP. So I will not be voting for this. Thank you. I'm oh, sorry. Could you say that again? Uh, one, one other time, Ms. Felicita. Are you you're, you're supportive of this or not? You're not. Okay. All right. Any other comments? Any none? Roll call. Mayor. Oh, I'm sorry. Councilman. Can I make a substitute motion that we continue this until we get those answers? Because right now I'm, 
I'm not really sure which way to go. Okay. Do I have a second? Second. We have a motion and a second to continue. I don't have to roll call, do I? Oh. A continuous? Yeah. I have one question. Is this regarding the listserv? Yes, Councilwoman Castor. The one that we have been, um, I want to say, <laughs> years of trying to fix, and the one that drives my staff crazy in trying to do newsletters and everything else? Okay. Yes, Councilwoman Castor. I want to get clarity Castor. that this was it, that yes. we're finally, okay. Okay, yeah. the motion is to continue this until, did you have a date? No, uh, my, mine, or no, no uh, Michael. No, Councilman Murakowski. October 17th? Okay. And, oh, I want to thank Ms. Mendoza, too, for bringing that up. Those were good questions. I'd like to get the answers as well, if you don't mind. Okay. All in favor of the continuance, please say aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion carries unanimously. We are to... 52? Uh, 50, 51. I thought we just did that. Oh. Move to approve item 51. That'll determine second. this. Second. Fantastic. We have a motion and a second on item 51. I have one card, Leonard Clark. Thank you, Mayor and Council Members. I wish I could say I was part of the beautiful indigenous peoples of our country and this world of the First Nations, but I am a human being and as a human being and an ally of our brothers and sisters who have suffered genocide for almost around 500 years with no really good memorials around here in Phoenix. We have monuments to a massacre in Turkey, which I'm not saying we shouldn't at the state capitol five minutes away. At least this is, uh, this is something to repatriate the remains, their ancestors, back to our beautiful brothers and sisters of the indigenous nations, First Nations. But I would ask, yes, I know the former mayor did some stuff with the park over there, Indian Steel Park, but we're not even touching it. We need truth and reconciliation. And with this, I'm asking you consider putting up a memorial. It won't ever make up for the millions that were exterminated through colonization, but at least the city of Phoenix could be number one, because all around us, this land that I'm standing on right now, this was, this is another people's land, and I cannot pronounce their name correctly, so I won't mess it up. Thank you for doing this. I strongly support it. Thank you so much. Thank you. Any other comments? We have a motion, right? So, um, roll call. Decisio? Yes. Guevara? Yes. Mendoza? Yes. Nowakowski? Yes. Pastor? Yes. Stark? Yes. Waring? Yes. Williams? Yes. It's a unanimous vote. Uh, item 52. Move item 52. Second. Was, okay, when motion is second, did you also want to make comments? I did. So, um, giplet, I guess that's, that, that's the correct term, g flat, I don't know, or however they say it. Um, on this item, or just the item in general, uh, as uh, Chris Mackey and I from the Economic Development Department have always been talking back and forth of the fact that uh, we um, have this um, g flat excise tax abandonment in order to start uh, some development within the area of particularly downtown. Um, and one of my uh, pushbacks on it is that, okay, if we're gonna be doing this, uh, I would like to see more, more workforce housing uh, within the downtown area uh, so that then as we grow and can expand very similar to New York and Chicago, that there is some affordability happening within our downtown area. And so I want to commend uh, the builder uh, that we were able to reach the 10% of workforce housing that I had asked for in our subcommittee. And so, uh, Chris, I don't know if you want to say anything on it, but uh, I would just want to commend uh, 
those that helped us get there. Mayor Councilwoman Pastor, the developer wa uh, listened, was at the subcommittee meeting and did listen to the conversation that was had and uh, over the, the next few days we were able to come to terms uh, where they will be providing 10% workforce housing with what they're building today, about 350 units, that will provide 35 workforce housing units for downtown. And can you explain what workforce housing is? Mayor Councilman Pastor, uh, what we've used is a HUD definition and saying that it is 80 to 120 percent of the area median income. And what we determine is that a person's income can support 30 percent of their income going to their residence, whether it's their ownership or whether it's for rent. Um, it supports their housing situation. So it will provide individuals who make anywhere from 80 to 120% of the area median income ability to lease one of these facilities. And so um, I guess I wanna be clear on, these are like teachers, public safety, uh, these are the type of incomes that we're speaking of. Uh, Mayor Councilman Pastor, absolutely. These are the workforce that are working in the area that uh, are supported by the, those types of salaries, teachers and police and, and the service industry that's here in downtown supporting the office sector and others. Okay, thank you. Really Great. appreciate it. Vice uh, Mayor, oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Vice Mayor, did you want to make a comment? Uh, I don't. Okay. Councilman Milikowski. Thank you, Mayor. Mayor, I just want to thank our staff and also the developer for all their hard work and reaching out to the community. One of the concerns we had out there was the affordable housing aspect of it. Um, they came in with 8% and increased it to 10. So thank you to Council Member um, Pastor for, for increasing the for workforce housing. Also um, the parking. One of the big issues that we have in downtown Phoenix is more parking slots and they agree to have 370 um, parking slots for, for this project. So once again, thank you for being good partners and helping us out with um, a solution for our parking and workforce housing in downtown Phoenix. Thank uh, you, Mayor. Thank you. Walter Gray. Uh, thank you, Mayor and Council. I don't know a lot about Giblet, but I know it's a subsidy and that um, we have too many giblets and subsidies in downtown Phoenix. When you take subsidies that are in downtown Phoenix, light rail, freeways, other things, that leads to a supplemental development in downtown Phoenix. And that brings people, teachers and police officers don't live in the inner city, even though teachers are poorly paid. They don't live in the inner city. And what we need is inner city people working downtown. They need job training to work downtown and, and not import people from the East Valley or the, the North Valley or the West Valley. We need to use inner city people for jobs that are close to home and that, that way they will, uh, th their communities will improve. Downtown will have its workforce and if we're gonna use subsidies for development, we should use it in the villages, not downtown. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you. Uh, any further comments? Roll call. DeCicio. No. Guevara. Yes. Mendoza. Yes. Nowakowski. Yes. Pastor. Yes. Stark. Yes. Waring. No. Williams. Yes. Um, six to two. Six to two. Okay, I believe it takes us to item 53. Okay, I uh, move approval for item 53. Do I have a second? Second. Uh, Councilman DeCicio, did you wanna make comments? No, I'm fine with this one, Mayor. You? Roll call. DeCicio? Yes. Guevara? Yes. Mendoza? Nowakowski? Yes. Pastor? Yes. Stark? Yes. Waring? No. Williams? Yes. Seven to one, I believe. Item 55. Move to approve item 55. Second. We have a motion and a second. Councilwoman Pastor? I have some questions on item 55. Do we have staff here?
Uh, my question is, um, I can't. <laughs> what was the Block Watch Oversight Committee rationale for splitting, uh, splitting and capping the promo items and the crime prevention tool line items? Mayor Williams and Councilman Pastor, uh, with me today is the chair of the Neighborhood Block Watch Oversight Committee, Carmen Arias, who I think is best suited to answer those specific questions. So with that, I will turn it over to Ms. Arias. Mayor Williams and Council and Council Woman Pastor. The reason that we split it up, first of all, is to allow more funds available for crime prevention. Uh, we feel uncomfortable when we don't have a ceiling on things because sometimes people get out of hand and spend too much money on things and we don't have a veto. And so we figured if we split it up, it was 3,000 for both uh, crime prevention and for <coughs> the promotional items, and so we decided to make it 3,000 and 3,000. That way that this crime prevention would have a better latitude of being able to spend money. Crime prevention is things like locks for windows, doors, steering wheels, uh, whistles for women that are walking alone or men that are walking alone, those type of things. We wanted to be able to spend money on those things specifically. I just have some concerns uh, regarding the split and then the cap, because um, I, I, I strongly feel that there should be more crime prevention line items than they're promotional. Um, and so uh, I'm trying to figure out how, uh, I think it's up to the block watches, or I don't know if you could do a percentage that goes to pro pro promotional, but. I would like to see more crime prevention within the block watch area. Councilwoman Pastor and the balance of the council, we are of course a recommending body, and so we will do whatever the council thinks we should do. I guess, well, Car uh, Carmen, <laughs> I think, uh, uh, and uh, can I uh, make a motion like 4,000 to crime and, and 2,000 to promotional items? That would work, or we could also have a 3,000 for promotional and 4,000 for crime. We have a maximum amount that we allow block watches is $10,000. Of that, of course, they have to allow for every penny and show us receipts for what they have done. But uh, I, there would be probably a little bit of an issue for the 3,000, less than 3,000 for the promotional items because a lot of that is used at the game events. Oh, got it. So three and four would work basically okay. if that's what the council would like. Okay. I would like to do that. That's my motion. And do I have a second? Second. You are changing um, what was recommended to us on the promotional? Yes. And uh, you are leaving it at three, but changing the crime prevention to four? Yes. Okay. And okay, we have a motion and second. Any further discussion? Yes. Yeah. Okay, we got, I think we've got to take back that motion. Oh, no, I, I, I was the one who made the motion, I think. Yeah. Did you? I made the motion. Yeah, there oh. was a motion. I did a friendly <laughs> amendment. So you're a substitute. You could do a substitute. It won't hurt my okay. feelings. All right, thank you. Okay. You go. I, I just want to make the comment that even on the promotional, I want to be assured that there is a crime prevention, prevention message. Uh, I think that's extremely important because that's the whole basic purpose behind the grants is crime prevention. And I've seen some of the promotional items that uh, had nothing on them. So I just think we should continue to spread that message. We'll do so, Mayor. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, roll call. To CCO. So, Mayor, can I, I'm sorry. Excuse me, Mayor, members of the council. Can I just clarify, so we're voting on the substitute motion by Councilwoman Pastor, correct? Are. Yeah, thank you. And sorry. just to clarify, our, our understanding is what we'll do is we will change that item 12 to restrict promotional items to a total of 3,000 and restrict crime prevention tools items to a total of 4,000. Correct. Understanding the desire that the promotional items have a crime prevention message. Yes, correct. That's how we will reflect it. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. De Cicio? Yes. Ivara? Yes. Mendoza? Yes. Nowakowski? Yes, and thank you, Carmen. Pastor? Yes. Stark? Yes. Herring? Yes. yes. Williams? Yes. 
I think that's eight zero, isn't it? And I too want to thank you very much. I know as chairman you have put in a lot of work on this, so thank you. I'm sorry, Mayor, I do have a question. Did oh. we in fact improve the other changes? Okay. Yes, everything else. I'm sorry, is, I was as, just a as little you confused. Proposed. Thank you. You're very welcome. Mayor, I have a question. You sound so surprised to say eight to nothing. Why is that? <laughs> Some things are rarer than other. <laughs> <laughs> We, you voted yes. Uh, well, yeah. <laughs> Item 57. Not in this next one, though. No. Of course not. Of course not. <laughs> Would you like to make the motion? Oh, sure. I move item number 57. Second. Councilman DeCicchio? Aye, Mayor. 57. Uh, no, 57, no. I'm good. Roll call. DeCicchio? Yes. Guevara? Yes. Mendoza? Nowakowski? Yes. Pastor? Yes. Stark? Yes. Waring? Yes. No, I'm sorry, no. Oh, wow. Oh, <laughs> I almost, I almost tripped you out. Looked at him. I so shouldn't that. have looked at you. Try I was looking at the next one. I was just shocked. <laughs> Williams. <laughs> yes, six to two, I believe. <laughs> almost had me. Almost had him. <laughs> How about uh, this one, Larry? I, I was surprised to think I was going to make the motion and be a yes, and that's what I was thinking. Uh, I move approve item, item 67. <laughs> Second. Uh, we have uh, Leonard Clark. Thank you, Mayor and Council Members. My name is Leonard Clark, living here in the city of Phoenix all of my life, except for a few years in the Army. I uh, think what you're doing is great here because it says here in the memorandum there are 42 steel tanks located at 33 different sites serving as potable water distribution systems and you know we've heard this again the stories of how infrastructure and things start falling apart it comes down to a competent uh, group of leaders in every municipality or whatever government organization is is leading its residents and we are depending on you and I think this is a good sign to help keep our, our drinking water clean um, because we've all heard the stories of Flint, Michigan, and there are, you know, as the governor did a uh, emergency uh, inspection last year of pipes and all of that with lead in them, that's still a problem, but this is a good beginning. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, roll call. DeCicio. Guevara. Yes. Mendoza. Nowakowski. Pastor. Yes. Stark. Waring, Williams. Yes, I believe that's eight zero. It brings us to six zero. Oh, 89. Move item 89. Second. We have one card, Walter Gray. Thank you, Mayor and Council. Uh, what item are we on? 89. 89. Oh, I'm just a, have a question as to what type of a project this is. Uh, I will have Mr. Stevens. Would you give a Certainly. reply? Yeah. What's the project? Mayor, members of council, uh, this request before you is a request to go from C1 and C2 to R5 multifamily zoning for a 1.81 acre site. Uh, this request was not um, was uh, not appealed to the city council, so the village planning committee approved it by a nine to one vote. The planning commission was a six to zero vote. It is located uh, a little bit north of 32nd Avenue and Indian School Road. We don't know of any uh, opposition to this case. It's a multifamily apartment project. Thank you, Mayor. You're welcome. Uh, any further questions? Hearing none. Oh. DeCicio? Yes. Guevara? Yes. Mendoza? Yes. Nowakowski? Yes. Pastor? Yes. Stark? Waring, Williams, Mendoza, eight to zero. Yay! <laughs> okay, takes us, I believe, to ninety-one. 
Okay. I don't think this one will be an eight to zero. Let's go. Here we go. <laughs> oh my. Okay. First, uh, a brief staff report. Mayor, members of council, uh, item 91 is a request to rezone a parcel at the northwest corner of Scottsdale Road and Kierlin Boulevard. Um, it is a 1.93 acre site. The PowerPoint is coming up here in just a second. Uh, the existing zoning is C2 PCD as part of the Kierlin Plan Community District. The request is go to uh, PUD Planned Unit Development for a mixed use project that will allow multifamily hotel and commercial retail uses. Staff does recommend approval subject to stipulations. Uh, this map shows the uh, general plan designation, which is commercial uh, in this particular area. Mixed use does fit within that commercial designation. The Kierland area is a designated employment corridor for it. You see this general plan map here as well. It shows the subject site uh, and a little star right here. That is the, the Kierland area. Uh, from a, a context standpoint, you can see that uh, here's a subject site with the yellow star. Uh, surrounding uses we'll talk about in just a minute, but you can see that single family neighborhoods uh, are across the golf course and then down to the south, the other side of the rest of the Kierland employment area, uh, which is a considerable way from that, from the, this proposed development for the established single family neighborhoods within this area. From the, the close up of this site, you can see that the Optima project uh, is directly to the south, uh, along the south property line. Uh, across the street is the, the shops um, for uh, uh, Scottsdale Fashion or Scottsdale One. Across the up to the north here is existing uh, home furnishing stores, and then on um, this side here is existing multifamily that is uh, three stories in height. This map shows heights within the surrounding area of, uh, of this proposed project. Again, the subject site for reference is here in red. Directly to the south uh, is Optima with 120 feet in height. 120 feet in height is part of the Kierland uh, Commons development for a couple of buildings there. The resort also has 120 feet in height for its hotel. Uh, you see some other heights in the area, 40 feet, 62 feet, uh, 70. 75, there is a request uh, that is going through the process in Scottsdale right now for 134 feet uh, as part of redevelopment of the existing uh, golfing use that is there today. Uh, the proposed development does include uh, two options. There's option A and option B. Option A is 120 feet uh, building height. Uh, the blue line shows the first floor form of it. The option B is the same blue line, first floor, but the development above that area is shown in red here, and the 196 foot tall building is a taller building, but is skinnier, so it preserves uh, a larger view corridor as, as part of this project. This is uh, something that the applicant has put forth both options. I just wanna be clear on the record that staff does not support option B. Uh, staff only supports option A, and that is also what the Paradise Valley Village Planning Committee voted to support as well. Uh, this is the, the elevations for the site that shows the, the two different options. Uh, this just shows some of the open space uh, around that particular project, and so you can see again, it's the same footprint that is here, uh, and then the open space that is around it uh, as part of this project is shown here as well. Um, there are, there's been a question raised about access for this particular site, and so there is a uh, existing driveway that has access to the north, uh, as well as a driveway out here to Scottsdale Road. The applicant is proposing this as a secondary uh, access point to the site. There is site plan uh, cross access through all these parcels to go all the way up here to the north. Staff does recommend approval uh, per the Paradise Valley Village Planning Committee and adoption of the related ordinance, and with that, staff's happy to answer any questions. Um, uh, Councilwoman Starr? I'm, I'm prepared to make a motion, but did you? I just wanted to ask you, it's, if you can move the slide back. You had talked about something about the golf in Scottsdale. I didn't hear you, because I knew people were moving in, and I, and I couldn't hear you. Uh, I'm sorry, uh, Mayor, Councilwoman Pastor. There is a proposed rezoning case in the city of Scottsdale to allow for 134 feet of height 
on the, um, the old uh, goofy golf, golf course, Cracker Jacks golf course. Uh, oh. Tells you how often I get to the city of Scottsdale. But uh, they are proposing to redevelop that to 134 feet, and that's this larger parcel right here. And we're right across, right? We're directly across yeah. the street. In this case, Scottsdale Road is the border between the city of Phoenix and uh, the city of Scottsdale. All right, thank you. Councilwoman Stark. If I can make a motion. I'd like to move to approve per the Paradise Valley Village Planning Committee recommendation that included a cap of 120 feet of building height, a maximum number of residential units of 169, and an increase, an increase of parking requirement, hotel parking requirement, to one parking space per room. Um, with that, I think we will probably have to revise stipulation 1T. Um, if no hotel is to be built, then we could up, uh, the uh, update, well, excuse me, right now it reads update to 169 residential, residential units. If no hotel is built, if the hotel is built, then there would be a maximum of 100 residential units. I believe there is a hotel coming, so. Do I have a second? And adopt the, yeah, ordinance, thank you. Do I have a second? Second. Okay. Uh, I need to hold a public hearing. And what I am proposing, I will give the applicant first opportunity up to 15 minutes. I will take cards for, for 30 minutes. Uh, I will alternate between um, those who say they are opposed and those who say they are in favor. Um, then I will give the applicant uh, 10 minute rebuttal. And after that, we will vote. So I will open the public hearing. The applicant would like to come forward. Good afternoon, Mayor and Council Members. For the record, Bill Lally, 25, thank you, Alan, 2525 East Camelback Road, Phoenix, Arizona, here today representing the landowner. Um, and I'll wait till they tee up our presentation. But uh, I want to first start by thanking everybody, not only on the council, the mayor's office. I know this has been a very popular case over the last few months. I know many of you have spent a number of meetings and a, number, a lot of time with us, with a lot of the stakeholders, trying to uh, listen to all of the issues, work through all of the issues. And I want to thank all of you um, for, for doing that. It's been a lot of effort, a lot of problem solving. Um, and we do appreciate that. The uh, same with staff. Staffs have spent a ton of time working on this issue, working on this case, working with all of the, the stakeholders. You see a lot of stakeholders here today. And so I want to thank staff as well for, for doing uh, above and beyond uh, work to try to get us here today. And we're happy to be here today. It's been a long road to get here. Uh, a lot of meetings, a lot of open houses, a lot of dialogue, and so we're excited to be here today to, to give you our perspective on the case. Again, as, as staff has indicated, uh, the property is adjacent to Kierlin Commons. Kierlin Commons, I think, as we all know, has been one of the major success stories, uh, not just in District 2, not just in City of Phoenix, but in the Southwest. I don't know another city in town that hasn't been um, relishing in having a Kierlin Commons in their community. It really was, was sought after on every community. Uh, every city wanted one. Scottsdale built a version of it across the street. They were so jealous. So um, it's been a great success story, the entire Kierlin area. Just to remind you again, we are adjacent to uh, the Optima development. This gives you an understanding of the scope of the proposed building on our side compared to uh, the, the Optima development that came through this body four years, four and a half years ago for rezoning to be very similar to what we're proposing today. The numbers there just reflect the size of the building, what's proposed in our building and what was approved in those buildings. As you can see, the building that's being proposed on the DMB parcel is slightly less, um, about 50,000 square foot almost, less than uh, the three adjacent buildings. Whoops, here we go, a little delay here. Okay, the, the history again, I, I think was, was indicated uh, previously, but 
the entire parcel used to be a unified parcel. It used to be the large Robin Stuckey retail center. Uh, that property was, was sold, actually, uh, a portion of it was sold and organized by our client, DMB Circle Road, um, a few years ago. Uh, the Robin Stuckey main parcel building was torn down. Uh, the applicant at the time went through the CCNR review and approval process to change the underlying CCNR heights to allow for the residential uses and for the 120 foot tall height on the entire parcel. Uh, City of Phoenix processed our application uh, earlier this year and as staff indicated, we did have two options in there from day one. One was a taller, skinnier building at 196 foot tall. The other one is what's proposed today, which is the 120 foot tall building, um, consistent with the Optima building, consistent with the height of most of the larger buildings in the area, the, the resort hotel, plaza lofts within the Kierland Commons. Um, at the village, uh, a a village meeting a few months ago, uh, the village actually reduced the density from 272 down to 169. They did adopt staff's recommendation of only the 120 foot option. Left the number of hotel units in there and obviously retaining uh, the square footage for the commercial retail. Uh, staff was not in support of the, of the 196 foot tall building and the applicant at the time was in full support of village's recommendation and full support of staff's recommendation today. Again, what's before you today is a much smaller 120 foot tall building from the original request. Uh, 169 total units. That unit density is exactly the same as the Optima approved PUD. Uh, 210 hotel units. And what's different than many of the other buildings in the area that are only retail or only uh, hotel or only uh, multifamily is this is a combination of ground floor retail, condo, and hotel rooms. So uh, three true mixed use uh, uses within a single building. Again, one thing that happened at the village planning committee was to make sure that the parking, parking is very important in a high density area, make sure that the parking is, is done per today's City of Phoenix code. Again, as staff indicated, the site, uh, the, the yellow outline is really the footprint of the building above the existing site. It cantilevers over um, open space and meeting areas on the ground floor. Uh, the parking stalls that are shown along Scottsdale Road really are just minimal. There's 13 there, reduced from the original parking island or the parking that runs on Scottsdale Road today, really for it to support the existing retail. The difference here is trying to keep the existing retail, keep a sales tax generating business on the property was important. In order to make that a successful retail business, we have to have some sort of parking on Scottsdale Road, but it is minimal. Again, the site plan that shows the building, um, building amenities on the ground floor, building amenities on the top floor, all open to the community as a whole. Minimal parking, um, additional open space, and additional landscaping along Scottsdale Road over and above what's there today. It does show 85% open space. So as we went through the process at City of Phoenix, we were really pushed to meet the open space requirements that was set forth by Optima. Optima has a minimum of 70% open space. They've met that with a number of amenities, uh, ground floor, internal to the building, outside the building. And so we were given a, a, a path, and we followed that path from City of Phoenix code. Uh, and, and we believe we will probably achieve somewhere in the neighborhood of 85% open, open space, including all of the amenities for the building. Uh, but we do have the same minimum requirement of 70%. Neighborhood outreach was obviously very important for this. Uh, we, we knew that this case was going to garner some attention, so we had a number of early neighborhood meetings. Those weren't really well attended. We had six neighborhood meetings, uh, not a lot of people attending. As you see, out of six, we had 20 total members attend. Uh, notice went out to not only the city required, but also to other stakeholders in the area that we knew uh, would, would be uh, very interested in this development. We, we realized that was probably not good enough, so we, we hired a company to go out and knock on doors, hand out flyers, and educate the community. So we knocked on over 500 doors. Uh, that number is probably a few weeks old. And obviously, as staff has shown you and, and handed out before this meeting, uh, there is a substantial amount of support from the surrounding area. 
this gives you an understanding of, of the, the support. A, again, I know staff has their own maps in front of you, and that's probably the latest and greatest information that, that demonstrates the level of support. This is probably just as meaningful as anything else. Um, knocking on residential doors is extremely important, but when those residential doors are a mile or a half a mile or a quarter mile away and don't access Scottsdale Road or traffic from this does not access their neighborhood, it's, mo it's just as important to talk to the surrounding property owners. As you can see from the red outlined, we've talked to all of the large property owners in the area, including the furniture stores to the north, Mace Rich, who uh, is the owner of Kierland Commons. So all of those entities listed there have signed letters of support and, and are in the record today. These entities, as you can see, Mace Rich, Plaza Lofts, Weston Kierland, Thomasville, these are large businesses that employ a lot of folks here in the city of Phoenix. As we've de debated this case throughout the process, it's always been compared to tradition, what's happened in the area, what's been approved in the area, um, is this too much, is it the same, and so this gives you an understanding of the most recent cases that have come before this, this body. Uh, the Lennar, Lennar case being the most recent case uh, came this past summer. And the things that have been talked about have been traffic, have been lot coverage, have been open space, and if you compare what we're proposing and the lot coverage and the open space on this exhibit, you can see that we're well within, if not meeting and exceeding what's been before you before. Again, another graphic that demonstrates uh, height, density, FAR, open space, lot coverage, in compared to those developments. Probably the most no noteworthy because we are absolutely adjacent to, which is the Optima development. If you look at the Optima development standards as approved in the PUD, 120 feet, we meet that. FAR, we're actually below the FAR, and that's of course indicates how much stuff is on the property in terms of building mass. Unit counts, the unit counts are much, much higher for Optima, but the density is exactly the same. The open space is exactly the same. The lot coverage, a little bit more because we do have a smaller site. Um, but if you look at the commercial square foot, that's where we set ourselves apart. 25,000 square feet of commercial retail businesses on the ground floor that none of the other buildings can claim that they have has a large financial impact to the city. Over a number of years, it could be 20 to $30 million financial impact to the city. The economic impact, again, general fund dollars, special revenue dollars, $15.8 million over the life of it, $24.1 million, almost 200 jobs. These aren't insignificant numbers. Many of these economic impacts won't be there, frankly, if it's just a condo building. When you do a true mixed-use building, you get the best of the world. Um, as staff indicated, and I think council noted, there is a development proposed on Scottsdale Road across the street. A lot of the hotel users who we have talked to and hoping to attract, which are the highest end users, they're shopping it around and they like Scottsdale's road frontage. They like to be on Scottsdale Road and they are absolutely looking at the Scottsdale side property as well. Traffic has become sort of one of the issues that we continue to talk about. Our traffic report as submitted and revised with the lower traffic numbers reflecting the lower density will show you that Scottsdale Road, which is our pr primary and only access point, is built to a capacity of up to 55,000 cars per day. Today it's at about 39,000. After our addition to and, and this is actually with the Cracker Jack large proposal built into it. Uh, we do not change the level of service on Scottsdale Road. We don't change the traffic volume any significant way. Kierland Boulevard, exactly the same thing. Up to 35,000 cars per day. It's currently at 12,000 cars per day. 71st Street, which again is behind us. We have no access onto 71st Street, but that, that Road today has 3,000 cars up and down a day. It's built to have 15. Our traffic report will show you that we do not exceed any peak volumes that would change the level of service on any of the roadways in the area. None of the turning points that we would have any effect do we fail or change the level of service. We have a small increase in residential traffic, of course, because we're putting much more on the property. But these roads were built for that. 
this has been another issue. We've, we've had a number of conversations, and this was a conversation at the village about cross traffic into the commercial buildings to the north. Today you have the three furniture stores, Bassett, Lumature, and Thomasville just to the north of us. All three business owners have penned a letter of support for our development. All three understand there's going to be an increased level of traffic going in front of their businesses. But when we broke down the traffic volume for when they're actually open and who is predicted to go through that uh, drive aisle, we're really talking about one car every 2.3 minutes. It's not going to be a, a traffic hindrance. It's not going to block any of their customers. And in fact, maybe they gain customers for having a little bit more volume going in front of their buildings. They understand that. They understand the impact on the businesses. And that's why they've pinned letters of support. Again, this shows the historical site plan approved by the city of Phoenix that shows it granted access going up through that drive driveway. All three of those building owners have a letter of support. In summary, the city staff supports this case. The village approved it almost two to one, modified the stipulations. They believed that the project was equal to all the other projects approved in the area. From a fairness standpoint, they made everything fair. They said, you have to abide by the parking standards of the city of Phoenix. We want you to be at the exact same height. We want you to be at the exact same density. And they approved it almost two to one at the village. The traffic report has been submitted twice. The first time at the higher density, it was submitted to the city of Scottsdale and the city of Phoenix. In both cases, both cities approved it. It was resubmitted to both cities. Both cities have approved the new traffic study that shows the lower traffic volumes on all of the roadways. Um, again, a significant financial impact, fiscal impact to the city with a true mixed use development. All we're asking for today is equality. We're asking for similar zoning that has been granted for 20 years in the Kierlin area in terms of heights and density. You have support from the major Kierlin players in the area, including Macerich, Weston Kierlin, Lennar, and the three most impacted furniture business owners that are going north. I leave you with just a couple comments from other stakeholders who do what DMB does. The two photos are the two mixed use commercial properties that DMB has developed, one being Center Point in Tempe, the other being the one Scottsdale project at Scottsdale Road and the one on one. You can see the quotes from Sharon Harper. You can see the quotes from John Graham. These are both very, very substantial developers in the area, our peers, and it'll give you a flavor for what DMB is going to bring to the area. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you. Ma Mayor. Uh, can I I'm, ask a question, Mayor? Are we allowed oh, to yes, ask now or no? You can ask. Uh, just one question, Bill. And I think everybody up here, pretty. Un I mean, we've had this case in front of us for quite a few months, so I think we understand it. Um, the 85% open space, I'm assuming that includes your roof. What would your footprint look like if you didn't have the roof as considered your open space at 85%? Yeah, so the, the roof deck pools um, is included in the open space calculation, absolutely. Yeah, it, it's just an unusual move. I, I'll, I'll leave that to staff to answer mm -hmm. the question, Councilman CCO. I think many developments over time have used community pools, whether they're on the rooftop. If you look at Plaza Resort or Plaza Lofts, which is Kierland Commons' residential units, that was their amenity that was included in their open space. So the precedent for using either rooftop or a non above ground floor pool amenities was set 20 years ago when Plaza Lofts was built within Kierland Commons. We followed the same formula. And I think if the city had said, you're breaking new grounds, Mr. Lally, DMB is doing something completely different then I think we would have been told that many months ago and we would have said, hey, the real number is this. But we weren't. They said, you know, this is similar to when you have a residential subdivision, and the residential subdivision has a community pool and amenity. I live in a community that has a residential pool in the middle. That pool has a gate around it, and, and, and it's only accessible by those neighbors within that subdivision. It's not a public city of Phoenix owned pool. Um, it was built as an amenity for that community. 
It's on the ground floor because it's a residential subdivision, typical. So the city of Phoenix's definition allows for the same exact community amenity to be built in an urban environment. But knowing that if you have two acres, you can't build a huge building and a pool and all of the other amenities. So if you go up two stories or on the top deck, that same amenity is exactly the same amenity that you would find in my subdivision or your subdivision or anyone else. So I think the city of Phoenix planning department had blessed our formula and I don't think it's as unique as you might think. So, and I'm not gonna belabor a point either. I mean, and this is something I've had conversations with your group too, and I know all of you guys, I've known you guys for years. Uh, you do great work, I appreciate everything that you do. But the bottom line is, we worked uh, four years ago when this case came in front of, not the, your, this case, but the Optima case came in front of us, they worked with the neighborhood. They developed a standard and a model that pro protected the quality of life for that community. Um, in your, and I'll, you know, pretty much projecting where I'm going with this. But at the end of the day, your model, your project doesn't fit the same model with the open space on the ground. I know you're only dealing with two acres, I get it. But when you look at the open space requirement that allowed the height to go there for the Optima building, that was done with the pure intention of protecting not just your case or anyone else's case, but also protecting the neighborhood and the, uh, the, uh, the quality of life for those individuals that, live, that are living out there. It took months, if not, I don't even know how many months it took of those negotiations to occur that created that standard originally. And, you know, someone like me, and I, I assume others on this council, like that standard that was created from there. No, nothing was done in writing that said that it had to be done specifically this way for all future cases. But it was very much implicit, it was implicit, if not direct, to a lot of the neighbors at the time that this was, was the standard that they were, were going to be used going forward. It's not just your case. What has to be looked at here is future cases that are going to be coming in front of us, and then what standard are we going to be looking at? And that's how I look at things. I mean, I'm one of eight up here, uh, but that's just how I look at things. Thank you. Mayor and right. Councilman DeCio, just a real quick response to that. Um, it, the exhibit on, on the screen today is, is of the Optima development. Beautiful development. We're, we're happy to own land right next door to it. What you see in front of you are uh, air, air grades, the metal grates on the ground, and what you see behind the glass is a basketball court, enclosed basketball court. So that is representative of the open space calculation for Optima. So the grate area is counted within their open space calculation. The indoor basketball court, not open to the public, is counted as their open space calculation. So they were given great deference and great uh, creativity because it's an urban environment. And so the City of Phoenix has given us the same flexibility as an urban environment to have an ability to create a great place wherever the amenity is, first floor, second floor, 10th floor, the City of Phoenix wants to make sure that you are providing Thank you. that space. Thank, Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, I have many in opposition and few that are in favor, so I am going to call on Nick Wood, who has 12 people donating his time, and keep in mind uh, there's 30 minutes allocated for both. I'm sorry, Mayor, how much time do I have? No. 25 minutes. Oh. Okay, I, I won't need that, but thank you very much. <laughs> Um, Mayor, members of the council, my name is Nick Wood. I'm with the law firm of Snell & Wilmer. My address is 1 Arizona Center, and I represent Optima. Um, I'm waiting for our thing to come up on the screen, but I just want to share with you, I find myself in very unfamiliar territory. I've been a zoning attorney in this valley since 1985, and this is the first time in my entire career I've stood before this body opposing a zoning case. Um, I typically will, will turn them down and will not accept them. However, in this case, the reason I'm doing this is one, obviously I represent Optima and I did the zoning on their property. And also this case is just contrary to city policy and the policy was established by this council since the time that the Optima case was, was, uh, uh, came before you. Uh, okay. Um, you've seen this, those of you who are on the council, we brought this to you back in late uh, 2013 and early 2014. Um, and I think you've seen it several times, so I'm not going to spend a lot of time on it. As you see, two of the buildings have already been built. 
There is a plan for two buildings right here. As you can see, they're very close to the DMB site. And the DMB site has some very interesting uh, geometry. And it's really a, almost like a remnant site of what was once a, a very nice um, uh, square. When we brought the case forward, um, we, had, we were looking at potentially five buildings. Uh, it's almost 10 acres of, of size. And we were told by the community in general, and many of the people are here in red shirts today that we talked to back then. And we were told that 120-foot buildings don't belong in Kirlin. And the reason is Kirlin is a suburban area. Well, of course, I you know, suggested that actually it's not. It's really an a urban area. It's an urban core. It should be. Very similar to downtown Scottsdale, downtown Tempe, 24th and Camelback, um, you know, downtown Phoenix. And the response was, no, it's not. One of the reasons isn't that in the general plan, the city of Phoenix has a designated core area. We all know what the purpose of village cores are, and that's where the intensity, the height, the density is supposed to be. And as you move away from those cores, everything's supposed to decline and, and, and lessen in number um, in both density and intensity. Um, so I suggest that this really is, acts as a secondary core. Um, but, this, but the bottom line was no one would accept the idea that this was anything other than a suburban area. So my question was, what can we do in order to make this work? Because there are two buildings in Kirlin that reach 120 feet. The first one is the, um, let's see if this works here. Right here, this is Plaza Lofts. In fact, that entire group was uh, posed to our project right from the very beginning. And as you can see, um, it's just the Plaza Lost Buildings right here, and it's part of the Kirland Commons, which is owned by Maceridge. And then this component of the Kirland um, Weston Resort is also 120 feet. So my argument at the time was, well, if these are 120 feet, why can't we have 120 feet? And the argument that they gave, which was compelling, is these two buildings at 120 feet are part of a very large area that has lots of ground level open space for the public to use. It's open to the public. So after a number of discussions with a number of stakeholders, and again, people in this room, people here in the landmark, uh, another example, and folks who live in the areas, uh, again, who are here to the north, to the south, and, and to the west, we came up with basically a general principle, and that is if you have 70% ground level open space, not open space on your roof, ground level open space that's open to the public, so the public is able to use, if you had 70% ground level open space, that will qualify you um, in Kirlin for uh, 120 feet. And following that case that this council approved, and again, when we came before you, we had started out with uh, about a, you know, 50, 60 people in red t-shirts at the village opposing our case. Um, I think that's why they're wearing red today, because they just kept the t-shirts from back then. But um, the bottom line was, you know, when we came to council, there was no opposition because we had basically reached that agreement with them. And we respected that agreement. Uh, you heard uh, Mr. Lally uh, uh, refer to the Overture project and the uh, Lennar project. As you, most of you recall, I did those projects. I brought them before you. And in each case, I was asked by the client, Would, can, I, can you get me 120 feet like you did for Optima? And the answer was only if you have 70% ground level open space that's open to the, to the public. And the reason is, this is a suburban area. Um, so they ended up doing 60 feet here, or 69 feet here, 70 feet here. I've since been asked about this parcel. This is the old room store parcel. That parcel has been vacant for over a year and a half. And I've received five phone calls in a year and a half asking me if I can get 120 feet for them. And my response is always the same. No. Okay, if, unless you have 70% open space, ground level, open to the public, it's not going to happen. I've recently been engaged by a developer of this site right there. Same thing. They're going to come with something that is below 70 feet. And the reason is they are going to have very little open space. Um, and you can see the results of that. You know, this is how we ended up designing the project originally. But here's an example. The building on your right, that building is 10 stories. We also reduced the height of one building to 100 feet. And you can see the open space that's open to the public. And this is only part of it that's on the property. Here's another shot. Um, uh, again, the open space between the two buildings. So that building there is 120 feet tall. And you can see the elegance of what is, of course, the Optima designs. And you can see the architecture is, is rather stunning. There's a suggestion by, by 
Mr. Lally that somehow we're using indoor uh, tennis courts for open space. Um, nothing could be further from the truth. You can't use anything that is indoor and is part of the structure as quote unquote public open space or open space at all. So I don't know where that's coming from, but that's just not the case. And I'll show you a slide that shows that. And there is the entrance, one of the uh, several entrances into our underground parking garage. All of our parking is underground, as is Overtures, as is Lennar's. I don't know why this isn't working well. You take a look at their site, and the site plan doesn't tell you much, right? You can see that broken line that kind of follows around here. But when you look at it, as you can tell, there's not a lot of ground level open space. They have, even have surface parking that's not con considered open space. So we asked our architects to put together this slide. This slide shows the amount of actual ground level open space pertains to the definition I'm going to show you for our project and a DMB project. As you can see on the bottom, it says on the left hand side, there's 74% ground level open space for the Optima project. On the right, there's only 31% ground level open space on the DMB site. For them to say that they have 84% open space, which is more than we have, is just an interesting argument. Um, they actually used our definition of open space in their narrative. Our narrative that we wrote for Optima up on top talks about, um, again, it's hard for me to read, but it defines open space as things that are not within the structure. They, of course, added something that says, um, including all rooftop areas. So they added the definition of roof, rooftop areas to open space in order for them to come before you and argue that they have 84% open space. At the ground level, they only have 31%. One of the other issues is the, the access to the site. There's only one legal access that they have, at least perpetual legal access that they have, uh, and that's out on the Scottsdale Road, as you can see right here. The problem with that is their traffic report shows that there are 703 trips per day that will go northbound from this site. Now you can see that, that, that you know, uh, interesting uh, median break that's there uh, doesn't allow left-hand turns to go north. Now why is it important to go north? Well, the freeway is north. The 101 freeway is north of here. It's the closest freeway and is where most people will go when they go to the freeway. If you go south, you go into Scottsdale, but the freeway is nowhere near um, this particular area other than going north. So their suggestion is, since we, can't go, since we can't go north this way, we'll just send our cars north through here. In fact, they, we have a, a slide that shows that. For some reason, this isn't, okay. So as you can see here, the, they will send them through the parking lot of the, of the Bassett Furniture Store, the, um, I think it's Lumin Luminosity, and then this, of course, is uh, um, Thomasville. And they'll send their traffic, all 703 trips per day, through that, including trucks. Now, you have on the first floor a furniture store in their plan, you have a hotel in their plan, a restaurant in their plan, and condos in their plan. So now you're going to have this very high-end luxury um, uh, building that's going to send all the traffic to the north 703 times a day to the north. The problem that they have is there's no assurance that that uh, entrance will remain. And I'll tell you why, if I can make this thing work. Okay. The reason is that this entrance right here is not a perpetual easement or an actual right. It's a license. We spoke to one of the owners of the buildings there. We did a, a title re uh, check on the property. They don't have an easement to use that. They have a license. Licenses as a matter of law are revocable. So as you heard Mr. Lally say, we have off period times with the furniture stores and it should be okay, but what if it's not? If it's not okay, those owners have every legal right to shut down that access. If they shut down that access, it's a very serious problem because again, there's no place for people to go to the north, number one. Number two, more importantly, where do their trucks go? Again, they don't, you don't show back of house. You, you have a, a, a ramp that goes down underneath, but it doesn't show any turning radii. We had our traffic engineers look at the turning radii, and it just it doesn't really work. So the bottom line is um, they don't have the access to the north, so they've got potentially 703 cars that could get cut off from northbound uh, in the future. The next issue really is one that's important to Optima, and that is um, certainty. 
You know, all the projects that I've brought before you in Kirlin, I'm going to show you some pictures in a minute, have shown a significant detail in the architecture and the design, the site plans, the landscape plans, everything that's there. What you see here, that's nothing more than a massing. That's not an architectural design. That's a massing with some fins that are put on it, which are supposedly supposed to be, I guess, um, uh, patios or balconies or something. They dumb down the architecture of the, of the Optima site just so it doesn't, it doesn't make theirs look so bad. But if I'm Optima and, I'm, and I've already invested $250 million in a project and I have another $200 million to invest for, in condos, my buyers are going to want to know what that looks like when they, when they move in. And this doesn't tell them anything. This doesn't, there's nothing to tie them to, to, again, this can be changed because it's not real. You look at this, and it creates a wall along Scottsdale Road in a suburban area, you know, with this, with this uh, triangular-shaped deal. And again, it's not, it's not a architectural detail. You look at the other projects that I brought to you. This is the Overture project. You can see not only the site plan, and I mean, you, you can see the, the, the actual layout of all of the units and all of the landscape. Um, the architectural detail is real architecture. In fact, we went and hired Kitchen Sink to do a computer-generated model of what it would look like when it's done. And that's what I presented to you when I brought it here to Council. Uh, same thing with the Lennar project that we just brought to you. Actually, it was July 5th of this year. Um, here's a site plan. Across the street is the, uh, the landmark property. Again, we have a site plan that shows, shows a, uh, a unit layouts. It shows landscape plans, et cetera. I mean, look at the architectural detail that's here. This is, this is real stuff. Okay, what you're seeing there is nothing more than uh, a speculative design in order to increase the zoning uh, in order to add value. Um, I don't know why this is not working very well. Um, the last issue is setbacks. Um, we have a setback on the Optima uh, building that's along uh, uh, Scottsdale Road of 65 feet. Um, they're proposing 50 feet. The problem is they don't have the legal right to do 50 feet because the parcel declarations that are on the site only permit 60 feet. In addition, they don't even have the, the, the right to build anything other than a um, apartment building or a multifamily residential building under the CCNRs. When we did the, the amendment to the CCNRs for the Optima site, we uh, increased these, um, the permitted height on the buildings to 120 feet and they came along for the ride. The law in the state of Arizona requires that if you amend CCNRs to give yourself an additional benefit, to give yourself additional height, give yourself additional uses, you are compelled by law to make sure everybody else that's subject to the CCNRs have the same right. Um, that case is the La Esperanza uh, 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 sec uh, first security uh, title case. That was 1984. So you may hear them come up and say, well, we negotiated 120 feet with Optima. Why are they opposing us now? No, there was no negotiation. We had no choice. But what we did put in here is that you're only allowed to do residential. You can't do a hotel. They're not permitted to do that. They're not permitted to do a 50-foot setback. And of course, you know, there's, there's sewer issues that the neighbors here are concerned about because there's going to have to be a sewer expansion um, as, as part of this project. So in, in closing, we believe that this is, this is not fit within the general plan. Um, by the way, this is the, the staff's uh, breakdown of um, support and opposition. The yellow is opposition, and you can see that in the residential areas that are closer uh, to us, that's where the opposition is. And of course, the support is far in the northwest, uh, farther away than, uh, than any of the others. But the bottom line is, um, the general plan does not call for this to be a secondary core. I even suggested during the general plan process back in 2014 uh, with staff that they make this a secondary core. In fact, I said this should be a primary core because the, the primary core is the uh, Paradise Valley Shopping Center, which is not going to be dense or intense, at least as far as height. But you as a council decided not to do that. So you set that policy of not making this an urban core and having this continue to be a suburban area. With the suburban area, you have to make sure that it's walkable, that it's open space, and all the other things that go with it. Second thing is, they don't have the ability to take cars north as a matter of right. They just have a license that can be terminated in the future. 
Third, they don't even have real architecture. We have no idea what to tell our potential buyers what they're going to see if they buy one of our units. And what, that, what does that do with the ability to sell units? It makes it almost impossible. So with, with that, uh, we would ask that you um, vote no on the motion that's pending right now. And I'd be happy to answer any questions you might have. Anyone have any questions? Hearing none, thank you. Uh, Peggy Neely. Hello, I came for item 36, but I'll speak on this item for a couple of minutes. Um, I'm Peggy Neely, and I live in the North area, and I just want to speak on a few things. Number one, Kirlin has always been a gem in District 2, and it's a huge economic engine for the city. And I believe right now what we're hearing, though, we know that there's condos that have been built, that there's a uh, existing zoning for additional height for apartments in a condo area and we have an application for additional condos today if I just want to tell you a little bit about traffic as far as I'm concerned and I think a lot of these folks that might be from district 2 I'm not sure how many are today um, actually may live to the south um, or they may live closer to me which is about 52nd and Bell this morning, I left my home at um, about 7.45 to be to downtown Scottsdale. I made it in 20, 20 minutes. The roads weren't crowded. I moved right along. So number one, I believe Kirlin is a secret that we need to keep strong. I do not think that this is going to affect anything other than developers that do not want additional condos coming on. Those of you that have been to DC Ranch, this is the group that built DC Ranch. It's incredible. We should want groups like that in Phoenix and building. I have a letter from Bruce Lang, who is the general manager for uh, Weston Kirlin. When I came on council in uh, 20, uh, 2002, the Weston Open, it's a wonderful uh, gym that we have. Bruce says, you know, I know DMB master plan this area, and the first to come out was the retail, and then the restaurants, the hotel, and now houses. And he is very supportive of this project, and I just want to relay that to you. I'm very supportive of this project, and I hope you will consider moving it forward. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I believe they still have five minutes of the 30 for speakers, so five. Kurt Jones. Madam Mayor, members of the City Council, Kurt Jones, 2525 East Camelback Road in Phoenix. I uh, just have a letter here to read from Lennar, which was Mr. Wood's case. Um, dear Mr. Bruner, on behalf of the Lennar multifamily communities, I'm going to express LMC's support for the DMB Circle Road project and their mixed-use project at 1545 North Scottsdale Road. As a developer and owner of a high-quality urban multifamily development in Kierland, uh, LMC supports luxury development, which will help urbanize the Kierland core. Adding additional high-quality residential will help strengthen and support the existing retail, restaurant, hotel, and office in the area. We believe your mixed-use development is a welcome uh, uh, to this area. Uh, just to follow up on Mr. DeCicio's comment on open space, that development used all of their open space on top of roofs. So uh, maybe about 5% of that is not on the roof. So there's no precedent set uh, in this area that all open space has to be on the ground floor. Thank you. Thank you. Karen Taylor Robson. Thank you, Mayor, Mayor uh, members of the council. Um, I have represented DMB for 24 years. I also represented Woodbine Southwest in the mid-90s when the zoning was put in place for the Weston Hotel, for Kierlin Commons, and all of the parcels surrounding the hotel and the golf course. And then later in 2000, I represented Woodbine Southwest in the zoning case that allowed the Plaza Lofts, C2 Midrise, and I'll just support what Kurt just said because I was there, the above grade, amenities were included, specifically included, in the open space calculation. So the vision for, for Kierland, 
that was set forth back in the mid-90s is being realized today. And DMB is asking to be treated equitably with the property owner that is immediately adjacent to it, and we would respectfully request your support. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Michael Burke. Mayor and Council, Mike Burke, 7600 East Doubletree Ranch Road. I have a letter here from Mace Rich, the owner of Carolyn Commons, um, and a partner of ours up in North Scottsdale. We've been partners for over 10 years. It says, Dear Mr. Bruner, thank you for taking the time to make us aware of your proposed rezoning at the property at 15450 North Scotsdale Road, now occupied by La Maison Furniture Store. As you're aware, DMB, Circle Road, and Matrix have collaborated in the past to create high quality developments in the valley. We trust this DMB Circle Road, Road effort will reflect the same commitment to quality. As we review the development plans, we're excited to see continued investment and reinvestment in the core area of this city. The area continues to evolve, including new uses, more density, and taller buildings. Your development and significant investment seems to fit with that continued evolution. As owners of Carolyn Common, we believe our retail and restaurant uses are benefited greatly by a vision of a core that includes greater density and higher quality development. We trust that the DMB track record in creating luxury residential and commercial de developments such as DC Ranch and Silverleaf will be replicated in a vertical fashion here. The purpose of this letter is to express our support for the rezoning to a planned unit development and the mixture of uses and height contained in your proposal. We look forward to the redevelopment of our, of your property. It can help in any way. Please do not let a, do not do not hesitate to contact me. Thank you. Clearly, they understand that retail is in a big flux in this market. They need the residences. They need the bodies that are brought in by hotels, by luxury residential people that have the money to support their retail. The city should be putting this project up on a pedestal and celebrating the success of Kierland, not cutting back and trying to stop people from building there. It is a, gonna be an economic generator for the city in the years to come. And if you turn it down now, you will take that income stream away. I wanna reply to Mr. Woods. I will stand by DMB's reputation to develop great architecture over anything Optima has done. He can sit here and show you a, a concept sketch and call it bad architecture when it isn't even architecture. We hire the best and we deliver the best. We have for 30 years in this valley. Thank you. Well, we only have 38 seconds left and I have hmm, all of these cards and they are all opposed. I'm going to put them in the record as such uh, but we did allow um, a timing for this, and we will be short 30 seconds, but I don't think anybody wants to spend the 30 seconds. I think the red shirts say it all. And yeah. Do you have to wear a red shirt? No, you don't have to wear a red shirt. But you got 30 seconds. Businesses, uh, thank you, uh, Mayor and Council. We've heard a lot from businesses who obviously uh, have are driven by a profit motive, and there's nothing wrong with that. I'm not saying there is. I, I'm here to uh, represent the residents. We have over uh, between 1,100 and 1,200 letters from grassroots residents of Kierland who are opposed to this, and they're opposed to it for the reasons you heard, which can be summed up by trying to put 10 pounds into a five-pound bag and it just doesn't work. Uh, and it will impact the character of the neighborhood, the livability of the neighborhood, and the enjoyment of that neighborhood by the residents who thought the plan that was in place was the plan that would remain. So I'll just say that and uh, ask that you uh, deny, this, uh, deny this application. Thank, Thank you. Thank you. Uh, we'll give 10 minutes for a rebuttal, if needed. Thank you, Mayor and Council Members. I probably don't need the 10 minutes, but I do want to respond to a few things that were um, indicated in uh, Mr. Wood's 
I guess, opening statement. Um, so open space, the policy, the policy that was set here many, many years ago or, or, or in 2014 that said 70% was the standard. You had to get 70% on ground floor open to the public or you don't get 120 feet. Now, as Ms. Taylor indicated, um, she's been doing work in the Kierlin area for many, many years. Uh, we've been processing this case for a while, almost a year now. Prior to that, David Bruner and DMB worked very, very closely with Optima uh, on the processing of their case, the lifting of the CCNRs to add the additional uses and height. And nowhere along the way was there a policy that was established that said, here's the definition of open space. Ground floor open to the public only equals 120 feet. I think we indicated that Plaza Lofts has an open space element above ground, not open to the public. I think we've demonstrated through the photos that there is an ba indoor basketball court in the Optima building. I highly doubt that's open to the public. We have tried our best to follow the rules, the rules that were set forth by the City of Phoenix zoning code. We've asked the City of Phoenix a number of times, does our open space plan meet the City of Phoenix's open space criteria? And we've been told time and time again, the answer is yes. So Mr. Wood can stand up here and say that there, this council set a policy four or five years ago when Optima came in and there was a deal made with the community that 70% open space ground floor open to the public was the deal, but that's not in the record. It's nowhere to be found in the record. His case came into this room with zero opposition, maybe four or five uh, folks from Paragon and Plaza Lofts, um, but there was never anything on the record that talked about that's, this, that's the, the new rule. If you come in down the road, that's the new rule. I find it hard to believe that the internal amenities at Optima, which is a beautiful community, are all open to the public, that I could just walk in there and play basketball, walk through their lobby with a bunch of guys and go play basketball. Hard to believe, but if they say that it's open to the public, I'll, I'll believe them. Traffic, so traffic uh, report was submitted to the City of Phoenix a number of times. Mr. Wood put an exhibit up that shows that, well, is, there's got to be a problem. I mean, what if something happens in the future and uh, there's more traffic that goes through there. Well, we've evaluated it. We've talked to City of Scottsdale. Staff has correspondence from the City of Scottsdale, who does govern the median. And City of Scottsdale has said, we'll work with the developer. We'll figure out if, if, if there's a problem. We'll work with the developer to see if we can't modify um, that median. Ironically, there is a median that is designed right in front of the Optima building at 24th Street and Camelback, right in front of my office building. There's five uh, Esplanade office buildings and a condo tower and a hotel that empty on to Esplanade Way right in front of the Optima building on 24th Street. The exact same medium break situation that exists there today and works great, I use it twice a day at least, uh, is something that City of Scottsdale would consider if, if the traffic became a problem in the future. Today, City of Scottsdale and Phoenix say there's no problem. But if there's a problem, we have stipulations and staff has stipulations that would address that problem, protect any problem in the future if something changes. Certainty was another thing that, you know what, all of Nick's Wood cases come in here and they all have perfect elevations and everything looks great and you know exactly what you're designing and exactly what you're approving. Well, DMB has talked to a number of the highest end hotel users in the world. What we're going to do is once this is approved and that hotel user is announced, they're gonna drive the bus because we want the highest and best hotel user at that site. And so we're not going to pre-qualify an architecture uh, before we have the best partner to help us design that. We have about 10 pages of architectural design guidelines in our PUD. Um, PUD for Optum had three pages because they had elevations. They, they cookie cutter stamp the same elevation all over town, so they were very, very um, ready to show you exactly what they're going to build. DMB, if you've driven it through any DMB community, I think they all speak for themselves. It will be a beautiful, beautiful building. Consistent with the, consistency with the general plan, Nick said this is inconsistent with the general plan. You have to ask staff. 
staff report says it is consistent with the general plan, so that is not an issue. Can't sell units because of the inconsistency with uh, what this is going to look like. That's the heart of why we're here today, folks. This is not a case that has traffic problems. This is not a case of open space problems. This is not a case of, of architectural elevations. This is a case of one developer who got what he wanted four years ago, 120 foot tall buildings, and he doesn't want another one right next door because he is selling those units to a few of the guys in this room. And having another building approved right in front of those units that he still needs to sell is not a good business practice. That's why we're here today. Other folks here today because they actually work for that developer. Many of the cards that were submitted during the process had that developer's address on it. So I'm not gonna belittle any of the folks that are in this room, but I gotta tell you, all of the large stakeholders that really have millions and millions of dollars invested in this particular area have signed on with letters of support. So this is not a zoning case about the merits. Many of you have actually even told me that. It's not about the merits of the case, Bill. It's about two juggernaut developers going at it. We're here today to ask for fairness and equality. They got it four years ago. We are here with the exact same thing. We have stipulations that address the traffic. Our open space meets city's guidelines. Elevations will come back through once we announce an amazing hotel partner. And with that, Madam Mayor, council members be happy to answer any questions. All right, Councilwoman Stark. Thank you. Um, you know, I spend a lot of quality time in Carolyn Commons. I, I, I love to shop there. And I notice from the hotels, many people walk over and they spend their time in Carolyn. Some of them walk across the street to Scottsdale Quarter. I'm not sure if I'm happy about that part, but it, it's true. Um, I, uh, I just want to talk about the hotel. My understanding is you, you do have a hotel, you just can't announce it right now. With that hotel, I think that brings bed tax to the city of Phoenix, which is a very good thing. We've been talking about revenue the last few days. So I think that's really important. But I also think a lot of those people that are gonna be staying there, I suspect, will enjoy walking down to Carolyn and shopping, enjoying a lot of the, the dining establishments, and there's a lot of great ones there. Um, I, I, I mean, are you that close to announcing? You just cannot give us a name yet? I mean, I don't wanna put you on the spot, but it sounds to me like, and the fear I have is if we don't move forward on this, then they're just gonna go across the street to Scottsdale on the east side where they're proposing 134 feet. And oh, by the way, my understanding, I checked with Scottsdale, is that they're in their second review and they're pretty close to moving on that zoning case. Mayor and Councilwoman Stark, the hotel is extremely important to us and I wish I could give you a name today. And I think that the, the, the finalists are nervous about this case. The finalists are nervous about announcing that they're gonna go here because they may have to go to Scottsdale if this body turns it down. Nick also indicated that you know the CCNRs would have to be amended for a hotel use. Well, the Optima PUD actually has a hotel use as an allowed use, so um, we're asking for exactly what they got. So the hotel is really the most important thing about this. I think it's gonna be a spectacular announcement for the city of Phoenix when we're ready to do so, and I wish, D I know DMB could stand up here if they could and they had the ability to announce, they would. Hopefully soon. Mayor, just a thought though too, um, if I may. Go ahead. We've got a lot of people with red shirts on. I mean, they probably traveled across our crummy streets. <laughs> the ones with the big potholes in them. Um, is there any way we can give them a little more time? I'd like to hear from some of the people that are out there, some of the citizens that are here, and, and, and then be, you know, well, give actually, the equal amount of time back to Bill Lally. Could we ask them uh, if they're all in accord, mm -hmm. if they are for or against, and just have them stand? Okay. It's I don't, I can't see the shirt, so I have no idea what it says. Could you, clar could you clarify that request? I, I'm trying to figure out what the red shirts are for. Are they for or they the are, case or opposed. are opposing? They were opposing. Okay. Uh, I, 
I, I have, I, I will answer a question. Maybe yeah. I announced how the timing would be, and there was a speaker that had all the cards attached to it uh, that spoke. And the time left, uh, please. Thank you for standing. Uh, to be fair, are those in support and who don't have a red shirt on? Yes. Uh, uh, I, I'm, I'm sorry, we can't do that at, at this point in, the, in here. Uh, it should have been done in a public hearing. I'm sorry. We, we already have a motion on the floor. I understand that. I thank you very much. No. No. Please. I'm going to close the public hearing. Thank you. Um, the motion, could you repeat the motion? Question. Of all the people in the red, how many of them live within a mile? of the project. Thank you. I have questions. So uh, Alan, can you tell me about the open space and the city guidelines uh, regarding open space and what it is? Uh, because it first started off about open space, or it's been, the talk has been about open space. I'm assuming, and then, you know, Don Miguel says, uh, Reese says not to assume. Those are one of the four agreements. So could you please uh, let me know about the open space? Mayor, uh, Councilwoman Williams, uh, the open space that we um, allowed for the DMB project uh, mirrors the same permitted uh, standards that we allowed Optima to do as part of their proposed PUD. And um, the, the difference is that with the DMB project, they are uh, counting some of their rooftop area, um, but that goes back to a uh, interpretation that was done in 2006 that um, by uh, the zoning administrator at that time that said you could count those open space areas even if they were uh, you know, up on roofs or on parking decks, so long as they were common area that was open to all of the residents. So it doesn't allow you to count your private balcony that you may have as part of your apartment or your condo, but it does allow you to count outdoor space, uh, whether that's a pool area or a little meeting seating area, uh, and that dates back to 2006. So this isn't a new concept. Uh, it is uh, being replicated in much of the multifamily apartments that you see today that are being developed. Uh, just drive up the street to Roosevelt Row uh, and you will see apartment projects that have two stories of a concrete deck parking and wood framed apartments above that. Their open space uh, for those residential developments is the pool area that's on top of the parking deck. Um, and it's for all of those residents to use. It's not open space for all the citizens. So it falls within the guidelines. Correct. It's very uh, mirrored or pictured as uh, Optium also has that. It's the same. Correct. Okay. My second question is, could you please explain to the hotel, uh, Mr. Wood, and I try to write it down quickly, um, why they're not allowed said something they're not allowed to do something and it had to do with the hotel I don't know if it was uh, where the hotel would be situated or if it was uh, on the traffic so Mayor uh, Councilwoman uh, Pastor 
I believe Mr. Wood is referencing the, the private uh, deed restrictions yes. that cover that site. And he was making a reference that they do not permit a hotel use on this parcel and that the proposed 50-foot building uh, setback would not be permitted as part of, of those CCNRs. The city is not a, a party to CCNRs. Those are a private legal government or legal agreement between the various owners. And so there are mechanisms to amend those. If that's what those agreements say, the property owner would have to go amend those, but they're not something the city would get involved with at all. Okay. And then... Uh it was about the traffic, and it was on uh, one of the slides demonstrated traffic going through retail. Just writing down all my questions. Uh, I wrote down traffic, parking, retail. I guess it was the way the flow of uh, the, the, where the residents would move through in order to get, I'm assuming, to Scottsdale Road. If we can pull up the, the presentation, I'll, I'll pull an area up because I think that will help explain a little bit uh, okay. better. Thank you. Um, the, the issue is that the primary access for the subject site is off of Scottsdale Road. They have secondary access to the north uh, via a, uh, a driveway that will connect the different developments. Uh, and so they have long time functioned in that same fashion where if you were at the Robin Stuckey site, you could drive up to the other furniture stores it's very common practice in other uh, retail developments. It's a way for the city to ensure that uh, you know, residents and users of the sites can go back and forth and travel around. If you think about any other shopping center or area, we try and promote multiple ways to connect through. And, and so they have, as part of an approved site plan, they have, uh, this one shows connection to the south, and that approved site plan does allow them to have access up into this area so that their residents uh, and future users of this site could travel north through here and go up to, uh, to this access point over to 71st or over to Scottsdale Road. Um, I think there's concern on the other side that that will be uh, something that these property owners eventually will uh, get upset about um, having too much traffic and they will move to close that off. There is not a cross-access uh, easement that guarantees them the legal right to do that. There's only the site plan that shows that access point through there. And so that is something that if it does uh, come to fruition, they'd have to work that out in the future uh, in terms of providing that access. But again, that's a private CCNR matter between those parties, not the city. When this issue came up, I did talk to my street transportation uh, staff who are traffic engineers to review this, and they were comfortable that even if this access goes away, that this future development could be served by this one access point here, um, and then they could go back and talk to Scottsdale about revising this median here to provide left turn movement in the future should they wanna do that. Okay, and then one last one, let's see. I just wrote it down, um, uh, the gentleman uh, that was standing here right be, uh, with DMB. Uh, he had said, you need to ask your city staff if it's inconsistent with the general plan. So, so uh, I didn't, uh, so I was gonna ask you the question. Mayor, uh, Councilwoman Pastor, it is consistent with the general plan. So the general plan calls for commercial, a uh, proposed mixed use development is commercial development. By way of reference, the city uh, treats multifamily development as, as commercial building standards as well. So a mixed use development is very consistent with the general plan. Okay, thank you. Are there any other questions? Councilman Murkowski? Yes, Mayor. Um, I met with some of the um, association individuals that live around here, and I would like to have just one of them just to kind of give us the summary because we really didn't hear from the people that lived in that community. So my question would be to Wayne, if you would come up here, what kind of impact you living here and the transportation coming in and out <clears throat> would impact the, your, the surrounding neighborhood? Well, um, I don't know what level of traffic the La Maison site enjoys right now. But I'd be surprised if you get more than 50 cars a day on average there. Um, 
when that was part of the Robin Stuckey site, you could exit either onto Scottsdale Road or you could go south onto Kierland, and you may even have been able to go over to 71st, I don't recall. We're now talking about, uh, by the numbers that were originally submitted, 3,200 cars a day. Now that's been reduced by 10%. Uh, so we're talking about almost 2,900 cars a day. And <clears throat> you've only got that one access and the secondary access. So if something happens to the secondary access, it's all got to come out onto Scottsdale Road. And when it comes out onto Scottsdale Road, it'll have two choices currently. It will either go down and do a U-turn to go north, which is probably what most people will try to do. Uh, and if that doesn't work for whatever reason, it's likely to go down, turn right on Kierland Boulevard, turn right again on 71st Street, and head north either to Terra Buena and try to come out, or go all the way up to Paradise Lane where there is a traffic light and try to come out and go north. Um, that's will have a significant impact on both Kierland and 71st Street just from the La Maison proposal. Waiting in the wings is Paragon on the west side who are proposing to triple or talking to people in the neighborhood. They have not filed their case yet, but the plan that they're showing people in the neighborhood is to triple their density from just under 300 units to 900 units. All of that will dump out onto 71st Street. So we think the traffic will have an enormous impact on a neighborhood that is bit fairly pedestrian friendly now, certainly has lots of open space, and we're very concerned about that. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else have questions? Councilman? Oh, I don't have questions. I'm ready to make a comment. And I'm are we at that stage yet? Yeah, but we have the motion, so. Figured. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, from my end of it, I'm not going to be supporting this motion, and I'd like to explain a couple things as to why I'm not, uh, I'm not going to be supportive. But at the same time, you know, it's interesting, and I was kind of reflecting back over here, <laughs> sitting back in the chair and listening to this and looking at the individuals. I think it's great that people come out. A lot of people look at neighborhood opposition um, as a negative thing. I think it's a positive thing. I think you're coming out. You're trying to make projects better. You're concerned about your quality of life. You care about what's going on, and I think that's phenomenal that you're willing to come all the way out here. So I thank all of you for coming out. Um, the other part of it too is, you know, there are quality people on both sides, and that's one of the things I was reflecting here. I don't remember the one gentleman that was over here, Mike Burke, that came up here, the one that you were referring to, Laura. He and I grew up together. We were high school friends all through high school. Uh, if you knew his history, the fact that as he had a single mom. Uh, his father passed away, military man, a hero, hero, uh, serving our country. He had seven uh, brothers and sisters total, and um, his mom took care of everything. He was just an amazing guy. And so, we, you know, you grow up here, you see those things. We used to ride motorcycles together, we uh, went to high school together, and we sometimes got in trouble together, you know. <laughs> So, but we did things, and it's just, it, that is a quality on both sides of it. DMV has been a, a great, you know, asset to this community and the state, and we do like them, and we appreciate all the work that you do out here, too. But in this case here, when you look and you talk about quality, we're talking about the quality of life, too, of the individuals that are living in that area. And we worked hard as a city. We, there were promises made, whether they're in writing or not, it doesn't matter. The fact of the matter is, for those of us that were around here, we knew what occurred with the Optima case. We wanted to see a quality project. We wanted to see something with significant open space, and we felt that it was going to create a standard for others that were going to be coming in the, in the area here. And you know, people want to protect that quality of life. I think it's admirable that you want to protect that. I think it's fantastic you want to, and I think it's a good thing. Don't let anyone ever tell you it's a bad thing. Uh, the fact that you're motivated, the, the ones that I always concern myself with when I see cases come in front of us, when there's nobody there, and, and you know, even some of those could be questionable, and there's no one there in opposition. But the fact that you're here, I think, means a lot. So likewise, when we looked at the model that Optima did, and they did an amazing job. I mean, they're in multiple places throughout the valley, two places for sure in the city of Phoenix. I wish they'd come in and do more, because if you look at their architecture work, the amount of open space they provide, the quality of life they provide to a community, and the amenity that they are as, a, in a, as an entity is just, there's nothing close to what they do, nothing close to what they do and provide into our, into our area. So I'm not gonna be supportive just because of, I, I think the promises were made back then. I think this is a great standard. If 
if the city votes to, uh, to not follow the standard that we created for Optima, I believe it's a promise that's going to be broken and there's not going to be any more standards, any more at least guidelines for the, for the area and for the community that I think at the end of the day jeopardizes everybody's quality of life. So I'm not going to be supportive of the motion, Mayor. I appreciate it. But I do want to make sure that people understand that there are good people on both sides of this issue here and quality people on both sides that have worked hard on it. Um, but this is just one time that we just don't agree. And we talked about this several months ago um, that I think that the open space requirement from my end is not, I mean, I don't see it as a rooftop, it's open space. It is open, but it doesn't mean it's open space and visible to everybody on the ground either. I think, I think the open space on the ground is critical for a quality of life. Thank you, Mayor. If there are no more questions, roll call. No, I'm sorry, we're to the council now. DeCicio? No. Guevara? Yes. Mendoza? Can I make a comment before my vote? Oh. Earlier this morning, I went to visit the site because I wanted to see it for myself. Um, and I also met with the applicant. Uh, there are some issues that I brought up to the applicant and one of them was the uh, traffic flow from the building onto uh, Scottsdale Road. Um, I know that, I understand that the, uh, the adjacent furniture stores were opposed to this project at first, but later uh, gave their support. I'm concerned about the traffic flow issues. There is only a right-hand turn on Scottsdale Road. The connection allows the cars to drive through the parking lot in order to make that left turn. Um, this might work for now, uh, but we don't know what can happen in the future. I also asked the applicant about uh, the agreement between the furniture store and themselves. Um, I was trying to get to the legal recording and uh, later I asked staff and there was no legal recording. So that brings another problem is someone can build a wall there later. Um, so. I'm, I'm also concerned about uh, emergency vehicles. There's not enough space there for emergency vehicles to practically either be in the building, get into the building, and if not, they have to go onto Scottsdale Road, and that's going to create a mess. Um, therefore, just public safety concerns, um, I, I can't support this. Thank you. Noah Kowski. Mayor, I'd like to explain my vote. I just want to let you all know that are wearing red shirts that you had strong advocates that came around. I know they met with my office. I'm not sure if they met with all the different council members, but you were all heard. And I had the same concerns that Sal and Felicita brought up, so I'll be voting no. Pastor. So in deep conversation yesterday, we were talking about generating new revenue. And uh, I don't want to lose uh, revenue uh, in the city of Phoenix, since our competitor is Scottsdale, and we will uh, lose revenue, uh, and they will generate our revenue. So I'm voting yes. Stark? I well said, Councilwoman Pastor. I hate to see us lose revenue, and if you think your views are being destroyed by this, you're going to have hype across the street anyway. Yes. Waring? No. Williams? I cannot support this case because of the cross traffic going through parking. I hate to lose revenue more than anybody. <laughs> But I think this is about good planning, and I'm very disappointed they couldn't come to a better solution than this, and I'm hoping in the future they do. The answer is no. Can I say something? Five to three. Or no. It fails, it fails at five to three. Okay. Thank you. So thank you. Um, I guess just a couple points about this before the folks in the red shirt leave, and I appreciate all of you being down here. Um, this is probably not over, so you might not want to leave, those of you who are leaving. Um, don't want to be ominous, but, but there are a few facts about the zoning process you should know. They're out of any of our control. It's just the way the process is set up. This is a very close case. 
Uh, I, I didn't know sitting up here, not really supposed to know either. Uh, you're not supposed to go around and lobby all your colleagues, and so I didn't. But I was curious how it was going to turn out, and now we know. Uh, for those of you who aren't aware, um, it would have to pass six to two. Correct, Brad? Six to two because of the three quarters vote, and it failed five to three. However, I think you heard there was a lot of discussion. For most of us, it was, you know, it was a close call. We respect DMB and their work and so forth. Um, we were very proud. I, I think Sal reflected those comments. Uh, I think everybody, though, felt that way. Some people are new on the council, so weren't here for the Optima vote. Um, I used to drive by their projects uh, when I go to my mother-in-law's. I still do. Uh, I, I thought they were beautiful, and I was really excited when they came to our neighborhood. Some of you in the red shirts opposed those projects, uh, but they kept working it, which I really appreciated. And by the end, you know, and have a complaint about those for years. You see them going up now. I, many of you probably don't know, I live right by you too. I drive by it all the time. And I, I have felt, even though I'm a small part of that, it's the people building it who do all the work and raise the money and so forth and have the vision. Uh, it's, not, uh, it's not for me to take any kind of credit, but I take a certain part of pride that such a major project moved into our district. Uh, when I heard about this project uh, about 14 months ago, I knew it was going to be sort of a battle royale, and I haven't been disappointed. Uh, there have been times, most of the times actually, if I could have voted, and I'm not speaking to the neighbors now, if I could have voted against both the developers, that's what I would have wanted to do. So unfortunately, you know, there was no compromise, no, both sides will tell you they negotiated, I would say both sides are wrong. So much as I appreciate the Optima folks, you know, there wasn't a whole lot of give there, and there wasn't on the other side, it appeared either, maybe a little bit, but probably not enough to make a difference. Here's how it affects you the folks in the red shirts who made the difference, at least to me today. Um, so if Optima, your neighbor, you guys had lost, they were planning on doing a referendum. You might think, well, it's a citizen vote, so that would end it. No, it would only, if, they, if DMV had won, they were planning to do a referendum, but it only applies, Brad, check me if I'm wrong on any of these facts, or Alan, it only applies to this specific vote. During the referendum, the DMV folks could have brought the exact same case forward again. You're like, well, they just lost five to three and they needed to win six to two. That's true, but next year at this time, they could have started the exact same case all over again, even during a referendum, not even knowing if they won or lost. A year from now, we'd be voting with new members. We only have eight members right now because Mayor Stanton resigned to run for mayor, so we're a person short. So a year from now, we'll have a new mayor. The mayor won't be mayor anymore. Uh, Felicita Mendoza which is well, wait a minute, down there, all the way down. She won't be a council member anymore. She's not running for election. That election will have happened by then. Don't know who will replace her. And Vanya, we wish you all success, uh, but, uh, but she has an election. Who knows how it'll turn out? There could be potentially three new members. Totally new vote. So, so that's number one. Um, uh, DMB can bring this case back regardless, uh, you know, in, in February or March. Is it March? March. Uh, and it goes to the same process. We didn't have a planning meeting this time because everybody recused themselves. That's a whole other issue. If you don't want to vote, you're on the planning commission. that is another commission. issue. Yeah, that is another issue. And if you don't want to vote, you're on the planning commission. Maybe let somebody else volunteer. Step but, down. But that's a um, subject for another day. So you can go through all this again. And I know you're excited about that because it was so much fun the first time. <laughs> so um, I, I guess I would beg, I would plead to the developers, you don't know how it's gonna go next time, either side, if it comes to that, try to work something out. For my purposes, because this has been such a hoot, um, I would be willing if you work something out uh, in the next 10 days, I think I would have until five o'clock on Friday of next week, to do, or Thursday, to do a reconsideration. Um, I would consider that if you guys could come to an agreement and then possibly, you know, these guys might have a different view of things. I would certainly hope that everybody would take things into account from their neighbors. I, uh, I, I don't expect that to happen based on what I've seen. I'm not lecturing and being preachy. You guys want what you want on both sides. I understand that. But it certainly would be helpful to me if there was, I've never seen one like this. I guess I'll just put it that way. I told some of the neighbors I met with, you know, I, I, there was no room for any change, really. Maybe a little bit on DMB's part, which I appreciate, but that wouldn't have been enough to, I think, make the neighbors happy. So it's just a thought. You don't have to take it. 
if you want to spend a lot of money as on lawyers and political consultants, I guess that's what can happen. But it just seems like it'd be so much better. I would love to see those guys build something that's great for our community too, that's successful, that works in congruence with, with the, the neighbors. Um, and we don't have to see a whole bunch of red shirts at, at a meeting again. That, that's what I'd like to see. That, that would be ideal for me, but I'm only one member. So, um, so I just wanted to say that. I, I also just want you to know sort of the facts of how this can go so you don't walk out of here thinking that's it, I'm never gonna hear about that again, because that's not true. And there's nothing any of us could really do to stop that. It's just, it's the way the system's set up. So hopefully, I'm kidding when I say this, I'll see you in a year, but, but maybe, maybe something could get worked out. Thank you. I appreciate the time, Mayor, and I appreciate your patience with this process. Thank you. Thank you. All right. All right. We have one more item. Oh, I thought we were going to 36 next. Oh, okay. But these shouldn't be. All right. We are then on item 92. I have to find it. Got it. This is the petition uh, related to 3818 East Lynn Rosa. The staff have a recommendation or a, a, tell us what your follow-up was. Uh, Mayor, members of council, uh, as part of this um, effort, staff had meetings prior to uh, this petition um, with uh, the neighbors as well as with the applicant. We actually put a stop work order on this project at one time, stopped them from doing construction. We made them revise their plans to become compliant with uh, the uh, setbacks. We had a third party do an, a survey of the parcel because it was in question between the developer and the neighbors. Uh, since that time, it has been uh, worked out. They did revise their plans. They did not want to, but staff made them do that as part of the uh, revised um, survey that was done. And at this point, uh, staff does not recommend that there be any action taken on this petition. Okay. Uh, we do have one card, Frank Zung. Zang. Thank you. My name is Frank Zhang. I'm here to talk about the former councilwoman, Kate Gallego. Mm -mm. He, he's the next. Ms. That's Gallego. the next item. That's not this item. I'm sorry? That's the next item. This is item 90. Yeah. What's, what's this for? This, this, this was a petition about uh, 3818 East Glen Rosa Avenue. Okay, then, then my, my, my name should be for the next item. You'll okay. be for the next item. Okay. So, any, are there any other cards? Hearing none. I don't believe we take any action. Uh, we now will go to the next item, which is 93, and we do have some cards on that. Um, brief re response. Mayor, members of the council, item 93 responds to a citizen petition. There were two requests in the petition. One was for um, uh, campaign donations made to former Councilman Gallego. Uh, campaign contributions are available for public review online, that uh, that website is given in the report. The second item asked basically was a public records request. That request has been submitted to our public records coordinator who is following up to fulfill that request. Uh, and so that is staff's report on this item there. And that's uh, former councilwoman. I said, yes, former councilwoman, Kate Gallego, yes, yes ma'am. Yes, thank you. Uh, Frank, do you want to come back up? Okay, let me continue where I left. <laughs> Ms. Gallego used to be a proud supporter of the Chinese, uh, Chinese Culture Center because it's located in her district. In 2015, 
Gallego actually made a video to promote the Chinese Culture Center. And this video was put in the city's website. Ever since the summer of 2017, when True North acquired 97 units of the Chinese Culture Center and the plan to demolish it, things start to change. Being the councilwoman of that district and clearly knowing the conflict of interest, Gallego had accepted campaign donations from True North for more than $75,000. True North had never donated any money to any city officials prior to 2017. Now let's see what happened with this donation. First, the video to promote the Chinese Culture Center made by Gallego was removed from the city's website. Secondly, the city issued True North the permit to remove the roof of the center, which is the first step to demolish the whole Chinese culture center. Thirdly, when Chu North forcefully kicked a small Chinese business out of the center by repeatedly cut off their phone line and the power line, the city instructed the Phoenix PD to stay away and not get involved. I need you to wrap up. So we demand the city to investigate whether there was a collu collusion between True North and the Gallego and any other Thank you. elected officials in the city. Thank, Thank you. you. Lyndon Clark. Be followed by Chuck Lee or Chuck Yee. Thank you, Mayor and Council Members. Now, you know that I love all of you because hate is a bad thing. It's much easier to hate than to love, and I know I need to follow this, but, you know, former City Council Kate Gallego, if allegedly she did do this, accepted this money, allegedly from the corporation, the very corporation she did not recuse herself from voting with, basically, who wanted to tear down our beautiful brothers and sisters of the Chinese American community, and their Chinese Cultural Center, our Chinese Cultural Center as an ally, I think that this bears investigating. Now, this is, for some of our friends though, although unethical in my opinion, might be legal, but welcome to politics in America today. This is why it is so good to see you allowing our beautiful people who support the Chinese American Community Center present their petition today, because now they know just like the citizens who are here in the red shirts. Democracy is not a spectator sport. In this constitutional run type of government, city government we have in this country, if you stay home, they have learned things happen. So although maybe legal, even though I think this should be investigated, the people's faith in the city of Phoenix uh, that items will be conducted fairly and that lobbyist and money and all of these things the faith of the people is what you need most because without that you won't be able to run effectively a city government when you lose the faith of the people so i would ask and i you know demand you know that we investigate former city council uh lady kate gallego and if no campaign donation violations legally were made at least point out that maybe in the new ethics policy, another to look at, is it right for council people to vote as they're running for political office to receive funding from the very corporations that they, they refuse to recuse themselves Thank from? You. Thank you. Let's not turn this into the Arizona State Legislature. Let's, back, let's bring you. back some clean government to the city of Phoenix. Thank, Thank you. Thank you. Check ye. Honorable Mayor and Council, uh, this is a situation that has been going on for more than a year now. So whether you're sitting on this council now or we're sitting on the council in the future, I'll bet you we'll see you again, just as uh, Councilman Waring has pointed out. 
the situation is not going to go away. The Chinese community has stayed focused. Our ears are to the ground. Our eyes are open. In that regards, following up on what Frank was saying, I have some documentation that uh, it is the result of lay research on the uh, um, matter of contributions. We're somewhat concerned there may actually have been a violation of, of con campaign financial um, standards and um, limits. But in general, I just wanted to remind the council in this election season, we know it's going to be an election season that's uh, pretty contentious, that uh, <clears throat> the Chinese community is still very much interested in preserving this center. There are lawsuits filed to, to help that process along. Uh, the community has donated probably on excess of $200,000 in legal fees alone uh, to this process. So it's definitely a situation where if anyone on the council can mediate or has influence with the other side to uh, suggest that it's time after a year without them carrying out the demolition plans that they've wanted to do with the bad publicity they've been receiving and will receive more of, uh, there is time for this to wrap up yet in a positive way. He has turned down three distinct offers including someone coming to the city of Phoenix, staying in a hotel for three days, waiting to hear. The most recent offer was also made and ignored, despite our good efforts to try and reach a solution. Thank you. Thank you very much. Charles, and I'm not sure what your last name is. I can't decide if that's a Q or a P. Well, I still can't pronounce it. <laughs> I'm sorry. Yeah, OK. Uh, 20 years ago, the city of Phoenix spent resources and the public money to help create the Phoenix Chinese Cultural Center. And last year, 180 degree change. City of Phoenix has been helping the True North Company trying to demolish the Phoenix Chinese Cultural Center. The community has been asking why? Why is this big change? Now with City of Phoenix help, with public information, we kind of figured it out. Let me tell you, each people can only donate $6,350. On February 27th of this year, David Tadasco donated an extra $6,350 to the uh, Kate Gallego campaign fund. The next day, on February 28th, the city issued a temporary fencing permit with the number TF, TCFN 18006260, which allows True North an, a whole year of permit to do the temporary fencing. Now, following this, there are more donations from executives of the True North which exceed the legal limit for political donation. The overall donation from a True North company executive exceeds $75,000. The illegal donation over the limit exceeds more than 25,000. So city must investigate, must do things right, must reflect its position and help to build a win-win solution for this case. Thank you. Thank you. Walt Gray. Uh, thank you, Mayor and Council. Uh, I just think that uh, I, 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 I'm not, I don't know this subject that well. I, my tendency would be to support the Chinese Cultural Center. But um, I just think we should be open. I, I know there's a website. I don't know where that website is, and our good city manager declined to spell it out. Um, and, um, and, I, and I just hope that website is simple so we can follow the contributions of all the city council members um, so that, uh, you know, Money seems to work, and also 
there seems to be a lot of, uh, or some at least, uh, you know, reward your friends and punish your enemies. So um, I hope uh, we can ask the city manager to give the uh, website. I think it's on its way over to you. It is on phoenix.gov. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I think this brings us back to the last item, which is 36. Pardon me? That's all the cards I have. Darn it. Okay, we'll have her come forward and give her name. Yeah, Mayor. Yeah. Councilman and Councilwoman. Uh, I'm here today. This is the very first time I'm speaking in front of a lot of people. I'm really nervous. Um, my beautiful people have pretty much told everything from their heart and concern the Chinese Cultural Center. And I'm pretty much sure, you know, you all pretty well know what's going on for the last whole year. I'm just speaking from my heart today because I've been in a state for almost, well, actually been 30 years. There's a lot of confusion in my life I'm a single mother, I'm a widow, raising three sons. And I am also a businesswoman, and I have felt like I've been a great citizen. And I'm proud of, I have this opportunity to be a citizen in the United States of America. And I believe in justice, but overall, I believe in God. In God we trust. But it's been 30 years. I never felt like I've been racist, like have people have brought me down because I'm Asian, I'm Chinese. But from the Chinese Cultural Chinese Cultural Center, this change changed a lot of view that I have believed in the our country. I love this country. I, I, at a certain point, you know, I felt like I could sacrifice, you know, in a certain points because beautiful country, beautiful people. But I'm so sorry. Thank you. I just want to say, in God we trust, I know what is the consequence. I want everybody in here from your heart and do the right thing. And that's all I want to say. Thank, Thank you, you very much. Thanks for coming down and speaking. <laughs> Mayor, I have a comment. I know many of my colleagues, we've written letters of support to True North, and we as a city have done everything we can legally to, to help out with the situation, but there's nothing that we as a city could hold True North in, in keeping any of the the roofing or any other stuff. So let me tell you that we'll continue to, to write letters of support when you, when you ask for them. I mean, personally, I can say that. But um, besides that, I really don't know what else we can do as a city because we've asked our staff and there's nothing with the planning and zoning or any of that that we can actually get involved with. So once again, letters of support, you can count on me on that. I know many of my colleagues are there also, and we support the Chinese um, Cultural Center and the Chinese individuals in our city of Phoenix. So thank you all for, for coming, and we'll continue to try to find a way to help out. Thank you. Mario, would you like to introduce this? Yes, Mayor uh, and members of the council, thank you so much. Uh, 
Uh, just to introduce who's with me here, Denise Olson, Chief Financial Officer, Bill Wiley, Interim Street Transportation Director, and Kenny Knutson, City Engineer and Assistant Street Transportation Director. The item uh, before us today is taking a look at the uh, pavement maintenance for the city and potential options to, to fund uh, the acceleration of pavement maintenance in the city of Phoenix. Um, and so I'm just gonna do a quick presentation for the council uh, and then um, we'll turn it over for, for questions to you. So uh, currently, um, just an overview of our current program in terms of our what's spent annually, we're at about $45 million annually on pavement maintenance. So this is a comprehensive pavement maintenance program and means that we treat all streets about every 10 to 12 years. This is quite an improvement from uh, several years ago prior to Proposition 104 to 2050 where the dollars on an annual basis for maintenance of city streets was as low as $13 million a year. That meant we really only could do asphalt overlay only. There was not other treatments within a comprehensive program. And that really meant that that asphalt overlay occurred on a schedule of about every 67 years. That's, that's all the resources there were to do uh, the street maintenance. Um, and so today, again, looking at what's planned over the next several years, you can see here, when we look at our major streets, which is our arterials and major collector streets, um, over the next five years, um, we see it averages um, between 50 to 80 miles per year. And then uh, with our residential streets, a little over 200 miles per year. Um, in total, we, we treat about 300 miles per year on an annual basis with the current resources. So the question uh, is what would it take to get our city streets to a, to a condition? And we've talked in the past about pavement condition index and in your report you have um, uh, a, some description of how we um, evaluate the pavement condition of city streets. But if, to, get to, our, to get to a level of what, what we call good condition or 70 pavement condition index PCI, uh, on our arterials, we, uh, w we would need within the next five years to do an overlay of about 519 miles. Uh, the overlay costs about $1 million a mile on an arterial or major street, so it's about $519 million. Within the residential streets, there's 3,566 miles of residential streets that would need to be treated over the next five years to, to reach a minimum condition of 70 PCI. In total, uh, and that's about $1.1 $1 billion to do that. So in total, we're looking at uh, nearly 4,100 miles of streets uh, at a total cost of about $1.6 billion. So that's, that's the aspirational um, uh, goal of getting to a condition of 70 for all city streets citywide it would take $1.6 billion. So with that, uh, we presented in your packet some, some options for potentially uh, funding uh, the acceleration of that maintenance. And so I'll just go over those quickly. The first option is to, within the streets current funding, uh, move streets funding that are currently allocated to major improvement projects, not, not to maintenance, uh, not to overlays or the other treatments, but to improvement projects, intersection improvements, roadway widenings, and those kinds of things, and move some of that money over to, to maintenance on an annual basis. Over five years, you could see $115 million um, uh, that, that could be available for uh, city street maintenance by doing that. The trade-off, though, uh, and this is an important one, is that it would require delaying several capital projects that are currently uh, in the capital improvement program uh, it also would reduce fundings of funding available for future projects that haven't been identified as of yet. Um, and so one of the uh, concerns that was brought up by uh, Councilwoman Guevara, Councilman Nowakowski, is that um, the delayed projects actually mostly fall in Districts 5 and 7. That's where the biggest impact to those are. So another um, option that I'm, present, I'm showing here is what we're calling Option 1A, which is of those funds, the unallocated, so where there's not currently a project that's assigned um, the unallocated dollars and using that money to move over to, uh, to the street maintenance fund. That would bring about $46 million over a five-year period. 
Um, but again, the trade-off there is not the delay of current projects, but it means that less money would be available for potential future development or improvement projects that are needed in the city. Mario, are, are you talking about this is more like a contingency fund? I know that uh, we've had some projects come in. We were required to do half a street or uh, a development project where a culvert was needed a small bridge or a cover. Is that what this fund covers? Yes, Mayor. So in a sense, it, it serves as a, right now as a contingency fund. It's funding that's there, but it's not allocated to a specific right. project that could be available for those types of improvements. Thank you. Yes. Just on, on top of that, though, but if we took that money, then there see, we see a critical need that could be a capital improvement project, then that might go away, right? So after last night's flooding, there might be some new needs that we need to review. Yes. And so that if we decided to use that 46 million, some of the issues and I, I know I saw a lot in my district, I think all of you did, that some of that might go away. Yeah, like that, might go away, right? That's right, okay, that wouldn't be you. available for those kinds of projects, yes. So uh, option two um, is, is where we start to look at uh, borrowing some money to advance funds uh, today um, and paying that debt back over, over several years. So this actually w and was one of the options recommended by our Citizens Transportation Commission with conditions, and I'll get into the, what their recommendation was in just a minute, um, but this option two is to borrow against um, T2050 funds that are currently in streets. They go to street, to main street maintenance projects today, but this would advance funds by, uh, by borrowing some against some of those dollars and addressing one-time immediate needs now. The trade-off is that um, it, it means that few future funds, uh, there's, there's less available for future maintenance. And so um, if, you're, if you're talking about, and we've worked with uh, Denise and her team closely on this, if it's $200 million, um, it, it would be about $15 million per year for about 20 years to pay that back. So that's money that wouldn't be available in the future for maintenance. Option three is very similar to that. It just goes into a different pot of money, which is the statewide highway user revenue fund, uh, which uh, this was also one of, the, one of the recommendations from the Citizens Transportation Commission to, to look at doing this. Again, potentially uh, up to $200 million that could be available within the next five years, but would have to be paid back. Uh, again, it's $15 million a year if it's the full $200 million is what's borrowed. Option four is also borrowing, but this actually borrows against um, the T2050 monies that are currently in the light rail program. And so uh, there's funding available if we look at the, pro the projections today uh, that would reduce the future reserves, but it would allow um, the, the money to be advanced and paid back over several years. Uh, same, we're talking about the same amounts here, 150 to $200 million to address immediate pavement needs. Uh, but because this is in the rail fund, uh, this means that if there's an economic downturn, there's f less money in those reserves, and you know they might put a project at risk in an economic downturn. Finally, uh, option five, which is uh, 5A, includes 5A and 5B. Um, one is to look at delaying the West Phoenix uh, light rail extension, which is the Camelback uh, extension going f would go from uh, 19th Avenue Camelback out to 43rd Avenue Camelback. Um, because of the timing of the s expected opening of this project, which is out in, in 2026, um, the, the money wouldn't be available until late later uh, in like 2023 20, or 2024, but it could free up $200 million that could be used uh, for within the next five years for the, for the pavement program. The trade-off here is that the project's delayed to the extent um, it goes out all the way to the end of the program and would not be completed or operational by 2050. Um, and so that's, that's just a consideration for the council on this one. And then uh, uh, option 5B is another light rail extension, the Northeast light rail extension, which would take uh, the extension from the current system out to the Paradise Valley Mall area. Um, this extension is not planned until uh, 2036. And so uh, because the funds are so far in the future, it doesn't actually help the immediate needs even, even with borrowing. Um, it could give, provide some potential uh, ongoing maintenance 
in future years. And again, the trade-off there is that it would not be completed or operational by the end of the program. A few considerations that I'm going to just cover really quickly. Um, depending on the level of the, uh, the pavement maintenance that we do um, within an accelerated timetable, traffic issues are something that we're going to have to plan really closely for to make sure the traffic restrictions aren't, uh, aren't too restrictive on any individual areas or neighborhoods and that people can still get around and access uh, where they need to go. Utilities, uh, there's several utilities buried under our streets and so that's another uh, extensive, we do a lot of coordination with our utilities today. We would really have to ramp up those efforts um, with additional pavement maintenance. So to make sure that we're not doing any, uh, we don't have any conflicts and, and managing those utilities under our streets. Um, contractor material uh, pricing and availability is something that we're gonna have to look at closely depending again on the level that uh, is, is um, approved by the council. So we would have to, um, work closely with our contractors and suppliers to ensure that um, they can um, provide that as, as quickly as we need it. Um, staffing levels to make sure that we have the, the right level of inspectors and contract monitors. Um, bike lanes, uh, we'll have to work closely with the community as we, as we look at uh, when we do our uh, additional bike lanes. Um, and then ongoing future maintenance of the streets and we'll have to make sure there's a plan put in place to ensure that the streets that are that are now done on a one-time basis can be um, maintained well on, on for our future. Okay. Okay. So I mentioned that the Citizens Transportation C Commission took action last week, and um, just they had really it's a multi multi-level uh, recommendation. One, the first they expressed a, that their priority would be that no changes be made to the T twenty fifty plan allocation. Um, within the five, first five years. They, the, the dialogue there was that the plan is still pretty new, it was approved by voters within uh, the last three years, and so their first recommendation was that no changes be made. However, uh, recognizing that the council's interested in making some changes, looking at some changes, there's a lot of constituent concerns about our streets. Um, uh, they provided the caveats that if the council decides to reallocate the T2050 funds, that you look at packages in options two and three, uh, which was the borrowing, but that also the council will explore other fund sources outside the current funding that's available to fill not only the remainder of that $1.6 billion gap, but also the additional um, debt that's created by the borrowing uh, in those two options. So at this point, uh, that's our presentation and we would just request any, any direction from the council. Yes, thank you. Um, first off, on the Northeast study, so there's no funding right now, and if we are waiting to 2036, we don't, Proposition 400 money runs out in 2035, is that correct? 20, I believe it's 2025. 2025, okay, thank you. So um, if we delay that, there's not even a guarantee that it would get funded anyway if we delayed the study. So, right? I mean, we, it's a gamble if we get a Prop 500 or anything like that, correct? I, I don't mean to put you on the spot, but I don't think there's not a Prop 500 out there, right? Uh, Mayor and Councilwoman Stark, um, at this time, it, it's an assumption within the plan that that, um, that, that funding, re that regional funding that's available would continue in an extension, but there's no guarantee that it would. So if there wasn't a guarantee and we had the study money, what happens, I guess, legally? Because I know we have to abide by what the voters voted on, and I know they voted for these future studies. So if something happened, what happens with that money in the future if we don't get any additional funds for light rail? And I, I personally don't think light rail is going to happen in that area, just given the density and and just the way it's built out already, pretty much residential. There's not a lot of commercial that leads up to the mall. And by the way, the mall may not be there. I hope it is, but it may not be there. So, I mean, what would happen, and maybe, Brad, you may have to research that, I don't know. Uh, or Mario. Mayor and Councilwoman Stark, uh, we do know that you can reprioritize projects within the plan. 
um, and that you know that even those extensions were all shown on the ballot. Uh, but I, I would say that you know there's there's no guarantee that the funding is going to be there uh, for for any for any of those particular fund sources. And so um, I, I think you know and and the city attorney can can chime in. But based on that, I think the council would look at how to best reprioritize based on the funding that's available um, based and on those circumstances at that time. Okay. That but the current light rail approval for Metro Center, South Central, uh, the West Connection is funded through Proposition 400 and, and also some federal monies, correct? Yeah, the assumption is that the federal monies would be there, okay. but the, the current regional tax prop 400 um, that funding is there for those projects okay thank you can, can, oh, go ahead you said south at metro and what was the third one you said the west, the west that's the out no. to the capital yeah. oh all right which is okay. the phase one of the i-10 right. capital west yes okay you may be very nervous there i'm me. sorry so Mayor, it's it's west to me. <laughs> Sorry. Mayor, just some clarification. That's from 79th on the I-10 to State Capitol. So out out going out to 79th Avenue is Phase Two of that project, which is currently scheduled for uh, opening in 2030. And then just lastly, I had an opportunity to talk to um, the member of the CTC that. It act actually represents District 3. I saw him at the Moon Valley Gain event um, this past um, weekend. He did say they did struggle a little bit because this was a relatively new tax that we put in place. But he also said that we recognize that we're probably not hearing the level of complaints that the council's hearing. They're isolated from that. And so I think that's why they added on the, the secondary recommendation. And and I I, I certainly assured um, my member, my representative, we're getting the calls. So no. um, I, uh, Banya, did you have some comments? I think she wanted to talk a little bit about option one, and she may have some suggestions. Go ahead. Oh, yeah. Um, if we wanted to move forward with options two or three as recommended by the CTC, what steps would staff, staff need to take, and what would the timeline look like for that? Because those involve uh, financing, I would uh, look to our Chief Financial Officer Denise Olson to talk about the, the main next steps. Thank you, Mayor, members of the Council. So what we would need to do is bring our financial analyst on board, um, and then we would just need to work out a plan to issue that debt. We probably could get something on the street in the fall, early fall, um, because we got to do a lot of work on doing that prep work. Do you have any other questions? Okay. Well, I don't think it's any surprise to anybody that I think our streets are a disaster, <laughs> and I think they're an embarrassment at the very least, and I believe that they're a danger to the public, and they're only going to get worse. Every single year that the City of Phoenix delays uh, fixing our streets, repairing our streets, even fixing simple street lights is one more day that our repair, disrepair becomes more eminent in the City of Phoenix. Uh, the questions I've got for you. We already have a street schedule. We covered this, Mario. I wanted to make sure I was clear on it, uh, and I want to make sure we're clear up here as well. Uh, we already have a certain amount of street, uh, streets that are going to be repaved, put together. It's going to be for the next five years. The $1.6 billion that we are looking at is in addition to that, that's under the 70%, correct? Uh, Mayor, Councilman DeSuccio, that's correct. It's, it's the additional needs beyond what we're already planning to do. So, I mean, if you look at it, I, what I would like to see is, depending on what happens today, I would like to see where the plan is, you know, a, the five-year plan, incorporate whatever occurs today into that five-year plan, and then I'd like to see what's left over after the fact. Um, I think it's still going to be pretty significant. We talked about it that some of these streets are just not going to be repaired for another 20 years or so. And if you, yeah, 
I can't imagine one street in the city of Phoenix that doesn't have a pothole right now. All of them have potholes, they're in disrepair. Uh, I don't, I, and, I, you, and I actually told uh, some of the presentations I give to the public, I say, if you wanna see the financial status of the city of Phoenix, and you wanna see the political leadership of the city of Phoenix, drive on any one street in the city, and you will see the type of leadership that we have here at the city of Phoenix that has literally allowed this to occur over these times. I've been talking about it, I went through my history since 2014, talking about how bad our streets are, and really started ramping it up recently uh, when we started finding out that there may have been some momentum to be able to do the right thing, fix the streets now, get it done, get it all completed, protect our citizenry, and allow the citizens to see the fact that we actually are showing some leadership qualities here. And I hope we do that today and fix all our streets. We have the opportunity to do that today and to do it right. Instead of, you know, what I've watched this council do repeatedly is that it's like equivalent to working in your yard and you mow half the lawn and you claim victory, you get a you know, slap on the back and you go get that iced tea and think you did a great job. Well, no, you didn't do a great job. You did an okay job. You only did half the job. You didn't complete it. And that's something I teach my kids, do it right the first time. If you do it right, you don't have to go back and do it again. So the leadership I'd like to see here is find out where we're gonna end up with this, whether it's two and three. I'm already hearing, you know, and I can tell, I can read the tea leaves up here that it's gonna be two or three. That only brings in maybe three, 350, 400 million dollars according to the numbers that are here. I'd like to know how we get to the 1.6 billion that's still under the 70% um, uh, rate that you, uh, not 70% rate, the, the quality, the, um, the number you put up there, the 70%, how, what is the plan gonna be for that? And I'd like to see that in a five year where we're going to be because every year that goes by, and this is the other council members that are here, every year that goes by, there's gonna be one more additional street that's gonna be added on to that because they may be bad today, fix it today, there's gonna be another street. We have over 4,000 miles, approximately 4,000 miles that are part of that $1.6 billion. That's an insane number. And it's only because it's been allowed to deteriorate and there's been no constructive plan put in place to fix it. And Ed, that's kind of your responsibility to help us put that plan together because you're looking at laymen up here who are not familiar with all aspects of the city. You got a streets department, you should be coming to us and say, hey, this is what it's gonna require us to fix the whole $1.6 billion that we need to do. It really is. I mean, I know it's an uncomfortable situation because some people won't want to do it that way. But at the end of the day, we have over $3.3 billion in the entire, uh, in future, light rail. $3.3 billion, and yes, as to Councilman Stark's point, some of it's in the future. You can move some of that stuff forward as well. You can finance that stuff forward based on future dollars, similar to the programs you put in place here. That $3.3 billion could do a lot to fix the streets of the city of Phoenix today, today. And so that's really a choice you have to make. Do you want a train that's outdated from the 1800s? Basically, that's the 1800s technology that goes from point A to point B in the day of, and age of Uber, where people want to be able to go to A to Z to Z to, to H to M. That's what people want to do today. That's what they expect. They don't expect these outdated models to work. They don't. Technology is moving at a faster pace. The world is moving at a faster pace. We have the opportunity today to fix our streets, do it right, get it accomplished, and don't have to go back and do it again. I'd like to see us accomplish something here, you know, just to be able to say we got something done. So I don't know where we're gonna end up with this, but it, if I'm hearing it's not gonna be that way, it's gonna be basically half-assed is the way I see it, um, and that does not accomplish anything. It'd be terrible for a sports team that went out there and put only, if you're looking at a football team, they only put out six players out of the 11 on the field. That's essentially what you end up doing. You're not gonna win, you're not gonna get anything accomplished by doing that. Thank you, Mayor. Vice Mayor. Thank you. Uh, so I guess the, the light rail was a cutting edge technology in the early 1800s when the steam engine became in vogue. Um, I think it's telling that that Northeast extension is headed towards a mall. Nothing against a mall, but perhaps the framers of this plan don't ever read the business page. But 19, or 2036, yeah, we'll, we'll see what's there then. So they don't even know what their target is. Uh, I won't be voting for anything that doesn't get rid of at least that spur. I can promise you that. But how did we get here? Sal's absolutely right. The streets are a wreck. Um, 
and it is embarrassing. It's the most mentioned thing when I go knock on doors by far. Uh, the only surprising thing to me is it's not mentioned more often, given I can't tell you how many conversations I've had at front doors. I'm like, hey, you got, got any comments about the city? First is like, nope, no, nope, I'm good. And I'm like, wow, because your road is a mess, and I'm actually calling it in myself tomorrow. And that has happened many times. I'm sort of shocked people have the patience with us that they do. To Sal's point, they shouldn't. Uh, light rail at build out uh, when T2050 is done, 56 miles of light rail. Sounds like a lot. I don't know. We got what, like 525 square miles in the city and 4,900 roughly miles of road. So you're going to be driving over a lot of crummy roads to get to a light rail stop when this is done. By the way, I'll be 82 years old at that point, and I'm sort of middle-aged. So some people in our citizenry won't make it that long. Maybe I won't either. I don't know. But they may not be around to enjoy the fruits of the entire 56 miles, and that's at optimum. They didn't meet their mark last time, and there's no reason to believe they necessarily will this time. Cost per mile? $152 million a mile. $152 million a mile. You know what it is to build a mile of a road like Camelback? 10 to 11 million bucks. You build a lot of miles, comparatively speaking. To redo a mile of a road like Camelback, which at least parts of it I drive, badly needs to be redone if you live further north, picking a couple areas that aren't my district so it's not parochial. Uh, Thunderbird in District 3, uh, total disaster to redo a mile of those roads, million bucks a mile. So you could basically redo 152 miles of roads like Camelback and Thunderbird all around the city for the cost of one mile of light rail. That makes sense to anybody? Oh, what, what moves more? Is it roads or light rail? Uh, roads by a landslide. It's dramatic, it's not even close. I'll get to that in a second. Of the 35-year, $31 billion plan that passed in 2015, 1.1 billion is for street repair. 1.1 billion, that works out to about, on average, 5.6 million miles per district. My district has the most miles of streets, so we get the shaft the most, but you know, most miles are going unattended every year, year after year. Uh, so it varies a little bit between 4.48 million dollars, but the average is about 5.6. Um, all the streets, though, around light rail are automatically resurfaced, and that I, this was uh, <laughs> creativity. The response here is classic, so I'll just read it. Uh, light rail projects include restoration of affected streets with new pavement overlay. If the costs are to overlay a particular street are covered by funds outside the existing maintenance fund, this frees up funding in the city for the citywide maintenance program. Okay. That, that's, that's like something right out of the book 1984, up is down, black is white. So I guess what they're saying is we spend more money in the areas that are already getting tons of money poured into them for light rail that moves almost nobody. The rest of us benefit because that frees up a tiny little scrap that we might get for our roads. Fantastic. Uh, how much of T2050 is for light rail? $9.7 billion almost 10 times as much in that project for light rail, which moves a de minimis number of people compared to streets. And as I suggested, to get to light rail, you're gonna to have to drive across those crummy streets for decades. And as Sal pointed out, they're only going to get worse. That wasn't a very good plan either. Um, so other little unintended consequences. So crime is up along the 19th Avenue corridor. Don't believe it, Google it provided the statistics to some media outlets. Uh, so we, as a council, I voted against it, because there's an increase in crime, had to reallocate $600,000 for extra duty police officers and transfer, transit enforcement unit to do targeted transit enforcement. So you're basically taking a sliver, of, I think it was four officers, you're taking a sliver of an officer who might otherwise be in District 2 or some other area of the city, and they have to go trundling over to Dunlop and 19th Avenue because of the increase in crime that coincided with the opening of light rail. Uh, but this is really enlightened, right? Because people are gonna use mass transit more. Mass transit use is skyrocketing in the city of Phoenix. No, it's declined dramatically. There's actually about the same number of people using transit in Phoenix as there were in 2007 and 2008. 61.9 million used it in 2007, 2008 without light rail. Uh, last year it was 66.8 million. The peak 
was actually in 2012, 2013, when it was 73.4 million. Mass transit usage is actually down 6.6 .6 million riders in the last five or six years. Now, it's going up a little bit, so that's great, but it's still down. I'm not saying that's great, I love people use mass transit, but we're investing a heck of a lot of money to have fewer people use a product um, that's used overall way less than the major product, which is the streets. It is the most upside down, blackest white, ridiculous thing I've ever seen, but today we're here, and I'm happy we're here discussing this because we weren't discussing it at all six months ago. So hats off to the people in South Central who brought this kind of back to the fore, and I appreciate all my colleagues' willingness to discuss it. Um, I would love to see the uh, Northeast Extension to the Paradise Valley Mall eliminated and that money used for streets. Bill, if we did some, uh, Mayor, if I may, uh, so if we did some combination of front-loading street repair, borrowing money within the framework that voters had had signed off on, to Deb's point, we can't just blow it all up much as I'd like to, and then we got rid of the uh, light rail spur to the Paradise Valley Mall, basically you'd be getting rid of that line to fund advanced street repair. Is that a fair way to phrase it? We discussed this before, so I hope it's not a confusing question. So I just want to make sure I understand the question. So, but yeah, if that if that funding that's currently planned for the Northeast Extension right, way out were to be future. reallocated to streets, it's not available in the next several years, in the next in the immediate future, but it could be available for for future street. And meetings. it offsets the borrowing that would be included in two, for example. Y yes, it could be. Yeah. So basically, it, it does what I just said. We're allowing streets to be repaired at a much quicker pace, addressing a very pressing current problem. To Sal's point, not letting the streets get worse and worse and worse because it just accumulates uh, the longer they go without maintenance. And then without the light rail extension to have to worry about, which was going to be way off in the future anyway, that backfills the funding that was needed to do what I just suggested, front-loading the street repair. Thank you. At least it's something. I have a question. Uh, how much money is allocated to the Northeast? North, Northeast. And when will that money be available? Uh, Mayor, Councilwoman Pastor, um, just need to look up the numbers quickly here. For the Northeast Extension, um, in all, including financing for the capital, uh, it's about $314 million. And then um, there's the operating funds as well, which in the first year is about $20 million per year. And the, and the planned opening for Northeast is uh, 2036. That's when the money will be available for um, or estimated? The money, the money could be available uh, sooner than that. Um, I, I believe we're, we're looking at closer to the year 2030, maybe in 2028. Some of the, some of the funds have been planned for the expenditures to begin um, closer to that period of time, at like around 20, year 2030. Um, but that's when those funds would be available. So like 10 years from now? Almost 12? R about 10 years from now. Mario, yeah, her funds, aren't they? What are they used for today? Uh, Mayor, uh, actually, I'm going to turn this over to to, to Kini Knutson, who can explain uh, well how how we use those her funds. Um, Mayor, members of the council, uh, right now our her funds we estimate around in, in fiscal year this fiscal year we get we're going to get about 135 to 137 million dollars in her that's distributed from the state. Uh, we use about. Six, the, the majority of that, or I said, the majority of our operating costs for our operating budget, uh, about 65 to 68 million dollars, uh, is comes out of the HERF, um, but also the balance of that we then use for our capital program and how we distribute the the capital program right now, and that's reflected in option one that was presented here. Is right now we focus about 50 percent of our remaining HERF funds on maintenance, about 30 percent on our major projects, 15 percent on mobility type projects, and then five percent for technology. So if we did not use her, 
uh, to move this forward. It could continue to be utilized as is today. Is that correct? Correct, Mayor. Okay. Do we have a motion? Oh. Mayor, I'd like to make a motion to move forward with option two as recommended by the CTC and that staff uh, reach out to affected stakeholders, identify staffing needs, and create a plan that focuses on our main arterial roads. Thank you. Can I, I'll second that, but I'd like to make a friendly emotion, uh, emotion. I'm getting emo it's, it's late. I'm getting emotional now. I, I mean motion, a friendly amendment to the motion. I would like to, to um, delay the, the Northeast study as well. I just, in my heart, I'm putting my planner hat on. I just don't think it's going to happen anyway. So if we could add that to the motion, I'd be happy to, I'm happy to second it. Can, can you add one more thing onto that then too to find out if there's a, a method or a financial uh, model we can create by moving some of those monies forward uh, through another, just as we're looking at number two, that you looked at number three, basically bonding against that for those future dollars. And then that way we can use those monies up front. And I think that moves, us, that moves the ball quite a bit down the field by doing that, if we can do that. I well, I, I just want to clarify that because I, I think the motion as I hear it is to do option two. Councilman, uh, are you suggesting doing also option three? No. Um, for whatever reason, I was thinking that option three was also going to be on the table before the meeting. So it's not. So it's just option two, but you're looking at getting rid of the northeast line, correct? Mm -hmm. well, Which is three. Delay or it. I mean, I think we'll, I we'll have to see where we go with. I'll use the politically correct lingo to be nice today. Thank you. And say to delay. But at the end of the day, um, <laughs> if that's $314 million, I, w I would like to see how we can move those dollars. I mean, you're, you're talking about $200 million plus $314 right. million. Then we're almost close to the $518 million that's needed to fix all the arterials. Yeah. That, at the very least, is a pretty good step in the right direction, is what I would say. If we if we can find that bonding mechanism to go after the 314 million, if we don't, then we're back to my original statement about you know, you know, it not being completed in 10 years. That's fine, but at the end of the day, you still want to move it forward. I'd like to be, if you'd like to add that in there somewhere, if you could. Mayor, City Council, if I can just um, add some more information to this. So we are bringing on a financial advisor and we'll be developing a financial plan for this. Um, our preliminary analysis does not show within that five-year period that we can move it that far up, but we can work with the financial advisor to see if we can move it up a little bit, but that would be like a, a debt structure where we would have some kind of balloon type payments at the end, if that makes sense. So we can look at those options and, and bring that back to the council. Yeah, I just well, want to manage the expectation because because that three hundred fourteen that, million is so far in the future. Right. We we're doubtful that it can be brought into the five years, but we can ask the financial advisor if there's anything creative. Just, I appreciate that that you said it that right. way because that I like where we're going on this. I like this directness. So on the three hundred fourteen million dollars that you're looking at financially, then if you could find a way. I mean, it doesn't have to be the whole 314 because it's always part of a pot of money moving forward. There might be portions of that we might be able to move closer to the five-year plan. I think with the $200 million, that keeps us and adds to the five-year. If we can find another way to bring in those dollars and maybe be able to bring in a portion of those or a larger, por whatever it is, closer, I think we're going to get closer in the city. I would still like to see a plan. I'll support this. I, I like that. It's, a, it's getting us in the right direction for sure. But I'd still like to see what we do for the remaining streets that are out there. We're still talking about a total of uh, 500, I mean, we're talking, sorry, 200, 514 million dollars. It's not chump change, it's quite a bit, but at the same time, it still doesn't accomplish everything we need to do with the 1.6 billion that we've identified that meets that 70% threshold. So I'd like to see what that plan is going to be from there moving forward. I'll support that, that's good. Thank you. Is another way to, to frame the motion, is it number two plus five B? Yeah, there you go. Okay. Oh, you're so simple. So simple. Is better, yeah, simple is better. <laughs> um, I, I would point out to the $518 million that, that Sal's talking about, again, each district, an entire district in my district, I forget, I think it's four, you know, 
400 miles or something. Um, you know, it's 5.6 million per year. So, I mean, this is decades worth of money for streets that at the moment we wouldn't be doing. So I, I just think this is, this is a, a big leap and a, and a big step forward, I think, I think for all of us, really. And I, uh, I applaud the effort of, of putting this together and, uh, and the willingness of staff to work on it. And uh, hopefully we'll come back with answers to what Sal was talking about uh, for another added bonus. But uh, the quicker we can do it, the better. But I do think we're definitely heading in the right direction. There is no arguing that point from my perspective. Anyway. Thank you. Uh, we do have some cards. And I, Go ahead. We had a motion and we had a second, correct? Okay. I, I want to ask a quick question before I go to the cards. This doesn't, this action today doesn't stop us from coming back and visiting this in a couple of years and reevaluating things. Because I, I am convinced that uh, there are some projects that probably will no longer be wanted by the residents, the businesses, and I don't want to spend a lot of money planning and, and going forward on some of those rail projects when they should never occur. That's correct. So I can come back, we can come back and revisit this and reallocate money. Yes. Okay. Can I go to the cards? Do you want to speak first? I just wanted to ask a question. So item two, or option two, is we're borrowing money. Mayor, yes. Councilwoman Pastor, yes, it's okay, borrowing. Okay, so we're borrowing money. Okay, thank you. Okay, John Severd. Oh, Sean, I'm sorry. Um, so, Mayor and uh, members of council, I have a quick question before I, I get to my uh, statement here. Now. If you go with this option, it's effectively implemented. It doesn't need to go back to the voters, anything like that, because this obviously is affecting the T2050 uh, right. funding. So is that not uh, a worry for, for you that you put it on, it was on the ballot with these rail lines. Um, you don't think that it should go back to the voters to make that call? Um, that's not a concern for any of you? I can only speak for myself, and it is not. This isn't the first time that uh, things have been on a map and have been altered, because by the time the vote is taken and uh, you go down the road, plans change, needs change, mm -hmm. and I think this is a great example of exactly that happening. Okay. Things, things do change, and I just think that the fair thing to do, if, if the citizens voted for something, I voted for light rail, I voted for T2050, um, makes sense to me that they should be given the equal opportunity to say, okay, this no longer makes sense. Um, I'm not sure why you feel that you all have the, the right to override the voters' decision to disenfranchise the voters of Phoenix who voted 55% for this plan. Um, so I'd like you all to consider that um, before you make this vote. Thank you. Thank you. Arthur Virgil? No. Um. Anthony says, opposed to option five. Did you still want to speak? Yes. Pardon me? I did. Come forward. Uh, members of the council, my name is Anthony Previtt. I'm here to speak in favor of the light rail. Uh, downtowns all over this country are booming, and including our own. Um, and that's because two things are happening. First, 70 million millennials are looking for places to live and work. They're moving to places like Portland and Seattle, and they're not moving here because we don't offer the kind of car-free living that those cities do. Uh, the second thing that's happening is that baby boomers are turning 65 at a rate of one and a half million each year, and 22 million of them are gonna do so by 2029. So we're looking at a massive shift in where people want to live from suburbia to urban areas. Um, what this means is that Phoenix has a choice between being a city that people leave and a city that people come to. Uh, if we want to be a beneficiary of this massive shift, we need to build the kind of infrastructure that's going to support the kind of walkable downtown urban living that people want right now and that people are going to continue to want even more going into the future. Um, if we choose inaction and fail to build this, we may end up with 
suburbia that nobody wants to live in, that is depressed, that, you know, frankly, that people have moved away from for other cities. Uh, all along the light rail where it's built, we've seen the market remake those neighborhoods in the image of transit. So people aren't going from A to B to Z to H. They're going along places that spring up along the light rail because we've built it. It just happens that way. It's happened in every other city that's done it. Things just remake themselves once you build it. Um, bringing the light rail into our suburban areas will allow them to redevelop into the kind of you know, spaces that we're gonna need. Uh, the only option that sacrifices our city's future in that regard is the options under five. So I would ask the council to move forward with any option other than ones that delay the light rail projects. Thanks. That's you, man. Thank you. Uh, how many people live downtown in the city of Phoenix? What percentage? One percent. One percent. How many people live and work downtown? Chris Mackey, our very evil economic development director, has counted them. 550, 550 people. How many billions in infrastructure do you want to provide for 550 people? It would take a pretty enormous, gigantic shift in attitudes of the 65 and overs or anybody else to change that dynamic. So again, I. I'd love to get rid of light rail to the person who was like, hey, let's, let's put it on the ballot and get rid of it, or, or at least give people a vote. Fantastic, I'm all for it. But this is what we can do today. I think the lawyers have signed off on this, right? This, this is within the confines of the law. We can do it, and I'm all for it. But again, to talk about these incredible demographic shifts, 1%, like 16,000 people. How many people live and work? All these bike lanes, right? How many people are biking from Desert Highlands or Tatum Ranch or something to downtown. I don't think that many. So how many people are left to bike to work who live downtown? 550. I bet all of them aren't biking. So sometimes these plans may sound great, but they'll be colonizing Pluto before some of the stuff we hear at these microphones actually takes place. Thank you. Reginald Walden. Good afternoon, Mayor and Council. Once again, I have wasted an entire afternoon hearing political gamesmanship. I am, I'm quite frankly, I'm tired. I'm tired of hearing about how we as a city cannot do this. We as a city don't want to do this. We as a city, this doesn't make sense. While it might not make sense to a couple of members who always seem to vote no on everything that comes before this council. There are people that actually think that this city is great and have chosen to make it their home, that actually prefer to take light rail rather than spending uh, the money to fill up a gas tank. Um, what we hear, uh, and, and I know that the streets are terrible, but I pose this question. How long have some of you been on this council? Some of you have been on this council and this is your second go around. Also, um, when it comes to taking funds from the light rail because people want to take Uber, well, you do understand that Uber requires a debit card. There are people that cannot afford a bank account. They are the working poor that need light rail in order to connect them with opportunities. And so I am changing what's on my card to support the, um, um, to support the motion that is now on the table. Um, but I would hope that we would take into consideration that there are poor people in this city that cannot afford what we come and from places of privilege try to put out as law. Thank you very kindly. Have a good day. Thank you. Uh, last card, does it, Peggy, did you want to speak? Oh, yeah. Well, come, you have two cards. I started out in support of this motion, and I know all of you 
probably know that uh, I've been working with two very large dealerships that create a lot of dollars. They, they pay for the salaries that sit in this room today. And I understand that we're looking for a way to fix our streets. God help us, uh, 35th Avenue and Cactus, hole in it. How are we going to fix it? But quite frankly, if we're going to start looking at removing things, maybe we ought to talk about the best use of the light rail. Let's look at 35th Avenue connecting to I-10 and taking it off a of camelback where uh, a very large university plus these dealerships would not be impacted. So if we're going to look at all of this, please consider looking at helping revitalization in the areas of uh, the west side, but let's remove it from Camelback. And I bet you guys are tired of seeing my face. I'm kind of tired of having to tell you every time, what about this area? So please consider giving some direction to that today that will allow West Valley to have some revitalization, but yet still give relief to large businesses that are trying to uh, continue to stay in business in the city of Phoenix. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I know we have one more card. I think Walt, I thought you were leaving, but I saw you come back. Uh, thank you, Mayor and Council. Um, you know, I, I'm very concerned about the streets. I have uh, McDowell Road between 67th Avenue and 75th Avenue is in horrible shape. I attended the CTC meeting last Thursday, and I commented then, and I, my same, what I'd ask you to do is we, all those city streets and my street is in bad shape, that you refer this back to the CTC. Uh, there are many problems with this Transportation 2050. Um, and we need to go to the public. Just a week ago, this council was making all these concerns about, the, about deep involvement with the public and we now we're, we're trying to make decisions uh, which does not affect all of 2020. There's a $17 billion shortfall in transportation 2050. Uh, half the money needed to complete transportation 2050 is not available. They, they, they thought they could get the federal money. They may still get the federal money. There may be other options to, to bring in the $17 billion. Um, so I think that this should go back to the CTC, consolidate the, what it all, so what the questions are, and refer it back to the, go out and hold the public meetings in every district and be, be open and honest with the people and see what they have to say. Do the people up in Northeast want that line or don't they want it? You know, how much of the people uh, really want streets? Or CTC said that the streets of West, on the west side don't need any attention. Thank you. Okay, so no more comments? I just, I just have some comments. Um, I understand that uh, light rail costs money. It's an investment. I also understand that we have to invest in our city in order to grow, in order to attract people. We also have to invest uh, due to the fact that if we want to attract large companies uh, from within the state, but globally, uh, we have to have some type of infrastructure of mobility. Um, because what it does is it creates connectivity, it, can, it, it creates vibrancy, it creates a community uh, amongst uh, this whole area. Um, and it also provides access to those that don't have access. It provides, not everybody has a car. Not everybody in, the, in our state, because we have a large population of poverty in our state, is able to get in a car. 
So a multimodal way of moving through our city and be able to benefit from our city is investing in transportation. Are there certain areas that we, look at, we can look at and determine that those bike lanes don't belong there? Yes. Uh, can we determine where uh, certain uh, buses, we need more buses because of uh, frequency and population? Yes. Uh, light rail, if anything, has provided uh, people to move around our city other than taking 21 buses to get to work. So to sit and just destroy uh, something that the community and the voters wanted is, is, is critical. Um, I happen to be privileged. I happen to be privileged in the sense that I have an education. I happen to be privileged that I have a master's degree. I happen to be privileged that I have the money to provide for my kids and I have cars uh, to move around in the city. Not everyone is privileged that way. And not everyone has that type of access. Um, there are also very privileged businesses in our areas that uh, have the money and want the money because uh, it's about their business. Uh, for me, I sit at this dais and it's about our community. It's about uh, building a vibrant city and it's about connectivity to our community and our city. So. Uh, Thank you for listening to me, uh, since you have to listen to everybody else. So I think we're ready to go. Well, not until I get to make oh, a comment. Mayor, I have a question, Mayor. <laughs> Mayor, I have a question. OK, do your question. So Mayor, just some clarification. I know that there's individuals that live out in the Levine and Estrella Mountain area that have a lot of impact fees that were going to be placed on the streets um, connecting to the new 202. And I've been getting calls about their concern that these projects would go away, the street improvement. So I just want to put on the record that none of those impact fees or any of that is going to be touched by, by this vote today. And also on um, the, the whole CIP um, funding for the Maryville projects and, and projects we have in South Phoenix. That's correct, right? Y yes, that's correct. Under the, under the Motion that's on the table, not touching item uh, option one. Um, that's that's absolutely correct. And, the op and it doesn't affect the impact fee program. Right. right. All right, just clarification on that. And then the other thing is, I know that I'm a very strong supporter in um, light rail. And one of the biggest needs we hear from our West Valley residents that I represent is that we need to make sure that we have some type of a reliever off the I-10. So I was secure. I was, I was let to know that we are going to continue with the, the 79th Avenue down the I-10 to the State Capitol to Central Avenue. Um, that that line is still in place, and we're not planning on, on replacing that, moving it, or any of that. Is that correct? That line is still currently planned. And then the last question would be our Central Avenue to. Um, to Metro Center, that was not going to be touched or none of that funding is being affected by this vote today, right? That's correct. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, very glad you made that comment on Metro Center. Uh, I have been a rail supporter for many, many years. I have been very strong in supporting 2050. And when we design 2050, as has happened in previous transit uh, efforts, that when you draw those maps and you draw those lines, it's based on certain assumptions and other cities' promises. And one of the reasons we have the problem on Camelback is that was designed to go across I-17 and go to 43rd Avenue to connect to the city of Glendale's light rail project. They no longer have a light rail project. So building something that expensive crossing Camelback uh, has a dealership 
who says he can move to a major university who says they don't want it, to end right there in the corner with nothing connecting to me it does not seem like a high priority anymore, and I really think that one should be put on the far, far back burden. However, that's not in the motion today, and I really will support this because I think this gets us down the road. I think this is the beginning. Uh, it continues light rail. I think we are gonna see uh, other transportation options in the future, BRT's one, uh, increased bus services on regular streets, and uh, as soon as you can fix that hole at 35th and Cactus, it will be greatly appreciated. Uh, the precinct is right down the street, so they let us know that it's very inconvenient. Uh, but I appreciate all of the council members. Uh, the, the vice mayor has been very active in pushing this forward. Councilwoman Stark has been very uh, adamant about this is important, as well as Councilman De I started to say Deacon Seedy. He's, he's a good guy. He was a good guy. I'm sorry. Cecile. I'm sorry, Sal. But I, I think it's important to recognize that there are needs, and needs change as time goes, and you have to adjust accordingly. And I see that as a, a genuine effort made today. So I support the motion. So roll call. Mayor, could I ask one thing, though, too? Is there any way we can add the Calmback line on? I'm good with that. We want to do that. Well, I think uh, the councilwoman's a little nervous at this point in time, if I understand it right. She wants to investigate it further? Yes. I, I mean, Vanya and I represent that area. And before I even think about doing something uh, in that area, uh, I want to go to our community uh, to find out if, what they want. <clears throat> And I think ADOT's building a new interchange there, which will also have an impact. So, but it can be brought back in the future for further yeah. discussion. I would, yeah, I would like to see analysis for the future of what the West Side uh, would like and if Camelback is feasible or not. So, roll call. DeCicio? Yes. Guevara? Yes. Mendoza? Mayor, if I may say some words, I'm going to support this motion, and the reason being it's because areas in my district have been neglected and overlooked for decades, and um, they deserve good streets. So um, I'm going to go ahead and, uh, and support this motion. Noah Kowski. Mayor, I'd like to explain my vote. I'll be supporting this motion also, but after asking those questions that the residents in District 7 were concerned about and seeing that none of that would be affected in the future. All the light rail plans that we had in District 7 will continue as scheduled. Um, I'll be supporting this. And also, it's great to see all my colleagues working together to make Phoenix better. So I, you all have, you know what your residents like in your, um, are the needs of your residents. So I want to thank you all for, for working together and making this happen. And, filling in those potholes in the city. Pastor. So I am supporting this motion due to the fact that uh, the councilwoman um, made a friendly amendment and she knows her area and her council area. Um, I'm also supporting, I'm, I'm glad at the fact that uh, councilwoman, or Vanya, and I will be able then to uh, work with our community to uh, look at the west side. Uh, there is lack of transportation and connectivity on the west side. And what that is, I don't know, but we have to figure it out. So I'm a yes. Stark? Yes. Waring? Mayor, permission to explain my vote. Uh, I think this is a tremendous victory for common sense. Uh, some people didn't like the things that I said, but you know what my source was for all these statistics? The city staff. Um, not some outside group, not anything else. This is stuff I've been talking about for a while, but these are the updated numbers. Uh, I think it spoke for itself. Uh, so I, I understand people who live right by light rail like it, but um, it was not going to make sense, as Deborah Stark said, going up to the Paradise Valley Mall. Uh, in fact, when she and I first discussed this, 
I, it dawned on me, I've never, I, I knew some of my friends were really against it, but I had never had, not one person's ever like, wow, I can't wait till 2036 so I can drive over to the mall, which actually isn't in my district, it's in hers. You'd have to drive through my entire district to get there um, and use the light rail. I hadn't ever had that conversation, not one time. What does that tell you? It's hundreds of millions of dollars and people don't even seem to care. But they notice the roads. South point out, they, they definitely notice the roads. So I appreciate all the work that was done on this. Uh, I, th I think there's gonna be a really, in the near term, a big impact that people will notice without any bigger ask of taxpayers. We're not asking for more taxes or anything else. The financing is contained within what's already been voted on. So we're really shifting resources. We're not asking voters for anything else. So I applaud the efforts of the mayor, Sal, Deborah, and everybody who's supporting this. Um, you know, thank you, because I, I do think the citizens will really benefit, and I think that's a great thing without asking them to like pony up even more money on top of what they've already done. Thank you, Mayor. Williams. Yes. Is there any further business? Adjourned.